we didn't realize that this entire crowd was not for you. Um, <laughs> but we, we think this has possibly been the first meeting of researchers in the museum space since it's reopened. I know they're really, really happy, and some of our colleagues from the museum are going to be joining us today as well because they have a great interest in this subject themselves. In ways of communicating what it is they do as researchers um, here at the university as well. So my name is John McCullough. I'm a poet. I teach here at the university, um, but I'm also the, the director of Creative Manchester. And you'll have seen many of my colleagues wearing a Creative Manchester T-shirt um, as, as you came in this morning. And if you have any questions about anything across the day, they're wearing their blue T-shirts. So please do approach them if there's anything um, you need to know. So what is Creative Manchester? It's a university-wide research platform, um, and what we do is we bring people together from different fields. Um, whose interests converge. And sometimes that's about starting a conversation between two people, um, sometimes it's about working on a funding application with an external partner, and sometimes, like today, it's about bringing people from all over the UK, from across Europe, um, to talk about their work together. Um, and we're really, really delighted to be doing that with partners. Um, uh, the Lake International Comic Arts Festival, um, who've been brilliant, they have their team in terms of helping to put all of this um, together. Um, Sheffield Hallam University, our academic partner, who will be taking up the mantle of running this event next year. And in Sheffield, there is Oliver East down there if you want to ask some questions about that um, later, later on today. And we're also doing this as part of our um, commitment to International Mother Language Day, because I suppose that's something which we, the UNESCO City of Literature here in Manchester is very committed to the idea of Manchester as a, as a city with many languages, um, and not just the languages of... Um, of comics, but also um, we're going to have uh, speakers from, um, us, from us from other countries um, here today talking about the art form um, as they see it. Um, I have a couple of other housekeeping bits before I hand over to your host for the day. Um, the first is that there is no fire alarm plan, so if um, if one does sound, uh, follow our team members. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> it was deeply unfortunate on the opening of the museum for where to happen, but um, so we look after that. There's also um, a questionnaire in your, um, in your bags, and it would be great if you could fill that out at the end of the day, because we do take everything you, you write down about what works and what doesn't work across the day into how we plan things um, in future here. Um, I, I think I should also say, as you probably know, there's going to be, there's going to be a live stream of today's event, so that's going to be happening you know, for people watching um, externally also. Um, and there will be photographs taken across today as well, so that, that you might see some photographers who will, who will be taking images um, as, we, as we go along. Okay, um, so our uh, MC today um, is Alex Fitch. Um, Alex teaches media studies and architecture, a great mix at the University of Brighton, where he is, among other things, pursuing a PhD um, on comics and architecture. His work on this subject has been published widely and internationally, and he's also co-curator of the annual Graphic Brighton Symposium, Symposium, and he's also host of the UK's only radio show on comics, and that's at the Arts Council's radio station, Resonance FM. So I'm going to hand over to Alex now, and I'm um, looking forward to talking to many of you across the day. run for a number of years uh, as part of the Lakes International Comic Art Festival and so previously has been part of the festival itself but this year and going forward it's being separated out into its own event uh, so that it doesn't get sort of consumed within the uh, greater comics event in uh, the lakes but rather starts to bring kind of academics and comic creators together in venues uh, such as this to begin a discussion uh, between both practitioners and researchers. Um, as you'll have seen in the program, there are some fantastic uh, talks happening today. Uh, this morning, uh, we have um, uh, Benoit Peters, who is both an academic and a comic book writer, talking about his work, followed by Dave McKean, who's doing very exciting uh, research into AI in comics. Um, this afternoon, we have representatives of Comic Art Europe and some luminaries from across Europe, including uh, the curator of the uh, Bon Dessiné uh, museum in Brussels, um, then academics also talking about their research, including people like Oliver East, who is also 
uh, a comic creator and an academic. So again, seeing those two kind of roles, those two kinds of approaches uh, to comics uh, mixing. And then the day uh, will end uh, with a discussion um, of what has been uh, kind of teased out of the various topics during the day, looking at, indeed, as uh, today's uh, topic advertises, what are comics? What can they do? You know, hopefully this is something uh, that today's various uh, talks will address in different ways and will give us all a new understanding of what's going on in the medium at the moment. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to remember Eileen McAvoy, who was uh, one of the curators of the Lakes um, Comic Art Festival and was very much involved in comics up close in previous years and um, who died in the autumn and it's something that uh, all of the curators of the event uh, feel is kind of like a great loss. Uh, she was much loved and will be much missed. Uh, so is in all of our thoughts today as we progress with the latest iteration of the event. Um, but to start off today's program, um, I'd like to invite uh, Benoit to the stage. If you can call something that doesn't have a race platform a stage, um, to talk about uh, his research uh, as uh, recently a lecturer in Lancaster University uh, as an academic and as a creator. Benoit, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I will try in a few minutes to give you an idea of the art of comics why I love it, why we love it in its different forms. And this is a drawing by my great friend and artist, Francois Keiten, a Belgian artist. We have done a lot of work together, but I will not speak about this aspect, but more generally about the art of comics through a long period. And the father Certain people say the grandfather of comics is this man, Rodolphe Töpfer. He was born in Geneva in the end of 18th century. And during his short life, he did a major work because he believed in a new form of art. He was not just a creator, but also a theorician about comics. And when we look to his portrait, we, we, we can see his glasses, and maybe those glasses are a secret origin of comics, uh, because he had a sort of uh, eye illness, and he wanted, as a young man, to be a painter as his father, but he thought that uh, he was not good enough, clear enough, but he was able to write, he was able to draw caricatures, he was able to, to play a theater plays, which was very important for him, and um, he was also a professor, and for the joy of the uh, students, he drew some stories at the beginning very privately, and the great, great uh, German author, Goethe, uh, saw the manuscripts when he was very old and was fascinated and encouraged Töpfer to publish it. So in 1833, um, the first story, Monsieur Jabot, was published as a book, not in a newspaper. And Töpfer wrote a small review, uh, only with his initials, about comics and defining what it could be. So this little book is of a mixed nature. It's, it is composed of a series of autograph line drawings, line drawings. Each of the drawings is accompanied by one or two lines of text. The drawings without this text would only be obscure in meaning. The text without the drawings would mean nothing. The whole continues a sort of novel all the more original in that it does not resemble a novel more than anything else. This is the first definition of comics and with the idea that there is something new. It's not just an addition of words and images. 
But it's the idea that there is a transformation, specific dynamic going from text to image and from image to text. We don't have speech balloons in the seven uh, stories drawn, created by Töpfer, but we have a lot of other inventions. First invention is that to, to, to draw the text with the same instruments uh, as the drawings, to, to try to do both in the same form with a great freedom. And you can see in, in this first published story, you can see the insertion of music, you can see the insertion of an image in the image, uh, a dream. Uh, this is extraordinary because it directly invented in this small form, going from left to right, so many things. And here we, we, we see some sort of parallel editing and a lot of people think, oh, this was an invention for the movies. It, it was created at the end of uh, 19th century or beginning of 20th century. But we see here two parallel stories uh, perfectly connected with those very small images, the way, the very funny way to, to insert a text and, and so on. We could show many, many examples of Töpfer because in each of his stories, this is the last one, he tried new things. And to use the drawings, not only as a picture, as a representation, but as a theory of uh, signs, small elements that you can combine. And of course, here we, 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 we understand that those images had to be read and understood together, not one by one. What is also very important in Töpfer's art is that he wrote uh, an essay, an essay in a form close to comics because of the insertion of drawings in the text at the, the exact place uh, that the image is needed and is in this essay of physiognomy, which was partially translated into English recently, um, he explained that something new is happening. It's not to have the idea of a story, to have the idea of a text, and then put images to illustrate it. The idea, the basic idea of Töpfer is to take the human face as the basis of the language. So what happens with the human face, for example, in the uh, upper part of the page, which is a character called Monsieur Crépin. He was a real hero of one of the story. What happens? You have, you need to have this character easy to recognize. So this is the permanent aspect of the character. But to have an interesting story, you need to have a lot of transformations of the face. This is a non-permanent aspect of the human face. And so the basis of Töpfer's story is the idea of the transformation of a drawing. A drawing is continued step by step, but expresses a lot of things. And years ago, I was in Tokyo, I was discussing with mangakas, and they said, oh, but you Töpfer, he was really a mangaka, because it's exactly the problem that we have. A simplified face, but a lot of expressions and the possibility to read on the face some aspects of his emotions and of the story. So this was Töpfer. During the 19th century, I will only show a few examples because I'm going very quickly, but we have a mixed form. Some artists are working for the book and a lot of artists will, will uh, work for the press, but Gustave Doré, famous engraver, uh, at the beginning of his career, created three important comic books continuing the heritage of Töpfer, because Töpfer was directly very <coughs> influential. He was imitated in many countries and translated. And here we can see the conquest of the page, the page as a wall thing. 
in top first stories, you see it's, it's sort of line. You could put all the pages on a wall and read them from left to right. But some compositions, this is only two examples in the wonderful book of uh, Gustave Doré. The story is hmm, politically <laughs> possible to criticize, but there are a lot of inventions and, and symbolic in inventions. So to give the idea of a thing and not only to represent it, and also to give an idea with different images on the same page. Uh, one of the first female artists now recognized as very important was half French, half British, Marie Duval. And she worked for Alice Lopper, and uh, for a long period she was forgotten, uh, censored. But now we rediscover the remarkable compositions, the decorative idea that were important, not in every page. But um, during the whole 19th century, um, there was a great, great freedom. People were trying in different directions. They didn't want just to tell a classic story, but more to experiment with drawings and words. This is also a remarkable page uh, without any word, without any speech balloon, because speech balloon is not a necessary part of definition of comics. It's, it's one major possibility, but you can work and in contemporary comics. Many artists were with, with silent uh, stories, always other type of insertions of, of words like in Dave McKean, for example. And uh, here we see how to tell a story just with nine images in perfect composition, very clear to read. Sometimes it's, it's a little strange because when we look at this page at the beginning, we say, okay, yes, it's a sort of Western story, not so difficult. But when we see the numbers, they are very small in the original page. So I put them big, one, two, and then you go to three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's very strange for us. And so we need the text. And the text is self the dialogues. So the general composition works perfectly, but the idea that to go from left to right and, and, and to, to, to go through the page in that way was not so obvious. It had to be uh, invented, or it was possible in a way to to try to make it differently. It's very important to, 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 to understand this idea. Uh, here, uh, I love this page by the French artist Carandache, uh, published in color, 1888. And here we have a perfect order, one, two, three, four, five, six. And what is incredible is that we just have a title, how to create a masterpiece. And I think this is a masterpiece, but of course, it's ironic. And, um, some people say that comics were invented with the Yellow Kid, 1895. But they have to explain to me why this isn't comics. Uh, because for us, this could have been created three years ago. And we understand the story, we see the idea of modern art, the caricature, maybe the admiration, an artist in an impressionist way, like Monet, maybe, impression, but also something like Jackson Pollock. And uh, the idea that comics is playing with the idea of art, is laughing about art, but also admiring, and the art of Carandash is great. In Germany and Austria, a lot, a lot of wonderful pages. This is a very sad story. I will not comment it. Uh, lonely, very sad, very sad story. But you have to understand it by reading the images, the panels, one by one, and you can understand everything. Of course, you have the title. But something like unfortunate, no luck, and um, 
a title can be important. It's a part of the text. It's, it's a way to, to uh, give us a first idea of what we are telling in a style and story. Here is the yellow kid, this famous yellow kid created in the American newspaper at the end of 19th century. And of course, the yellow kid is very important because he became very, very popular. And after the success of Yellow Kid, every American newspaper wanted to have their own comics character. So it was not the question of inventing in one page or two pages. It was the idea to create a character that you recognize and you, 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 you it can have different adventures and you can do some merchandising about him. It's, it's, our own magazine, this was very important. And so we can say that at the end of the 19th century, we have the second birth of comics, the birth of comics as a popular media. And um, at that time, especially on Sunday, the Sunday pages were printed in color and they were magic because the newspapers were very big very big, very impressive. So each page has to be read, but also to be looked at carefully because people had not so many images at that time. And it was not intended only for children. It was for the whole family. It was for everybody. At the beginning, here we are, <laughs> also working with the idea of art and laughing about art the Museum of Le Louvre, or not Manchester Museum, and uh, you see that at the beginning, Topfer was far away from the modern idea of comics. Uh, uh, Outcove was far away. Topfer was more close, uh, because here we have a combination of text and image, difficult to read, we can have different types of text, and we, we need maybe 10 or 15 minutes to understand this image. And I would co created a lot of pages in that type of composition. But at a certain moment, 1896, we have the yellow kid playing with this new photograph. And you see, we have always uh, some text on, uh, on the yellow kid himself. But here we have some speech values coming from the phonograph, from the machine, but not only from the machine, from a parrot. And speech values were a sort of joke. It, it, it was to laugh about uh, new inventions and so. But, but the readers loved it. And then Outco decided to continue even with if it's with a mixed system, you still have uh, some, some other type of text, but it became very popular and many, many artists used it for. One of the major artists, one of the first geniuses in the history of comics is, of course, Winsor Mackey. And the idea of Winsor Mackey, who was working for children and for others here in this series, uh, dream of the rear beat film is more like nightmares, so it's more for adults. And the basic idea is the power of transformation. Each page of Mackey is a simple story of one transformation. So you want to have hair, but then you will have maybe a little too much. I, I, I hope that I will not be like this person in a few minutes and some incredible pages beginning of 20th century he wrote so much that uh, he used the name Silas for some of his pages and certainly Sigmund Freud who was writing about dreams at the same period would have been fascinated by such a page incredible page incredible, impossible love story. And you are a puzzle to me. Little Nemo is a masterpiece. This is the first page of Little Nemo. We can see the freedom in the use of colors. At the beginning, we see that we have some 
caption text under the images because maybe Mackay was not sure that it was as easy to understand and to read. Now we see that we, we, we could perfectly understand the page without the caption. But it was the beginning, and even the idea to go from <laughs> left to right, and then second line, third line, it, it was built in a way. It, it was not a natural form. It's very important to understand. I had a discussion yesterday evening uh, about this subject. Of course, this idea of the wall impression that a, a page can give, it's not just an addition of panels. The effect here is direct, is incredible. The elephant taking all the place. You can see also the first line, which we have to read. It's not just a question of title. The title is drawn as an art form, and we could say so much about uh, Winsor Mackey, and if you haven't read A Little Nemo in Slumberland, I highly recommend you to, to, to read this masterpiece, because each page is an invention. This is here, the end of the year and beginning of New Year, the old year is falling, and you can see the two parts of the page how to, to go from one part to, 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 to the second, and of course, always at the end, you come back to reality, the poor little Nemo, uh, it, away. His, his parents are desperate, but they cannot do anything, and we enjoy it because he dreams so, 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 so much. And there is a sort of continuity from one page to another, but the most important project for Mackay is to give uh, this whole idea of one page. This is the conquest of the page. This is maybe the most famous page of Little Nemo. We could stay for a very long period. I just show it quickly. The idea of the transformation of the bed, step by step, the walking bed, the bed doesn't use shoes, and we are inside, we understand perfectly two characters in, in the bed, something is happening. And then how we go from inside to outside, of course it's impossible, the bed is, is too big, but there's a world is it works, and through the buildings, bigger and bigger, and the Art Nouveau, and higher images, and then <coughs> this perfect way to go from one image to another. And this is so natural, done with such art. In a way, there is no progress in comics history because it was already perfect. <laughs> and the idea to play with the medium, which is constant in Winsor Mackey's work. Other artists, other major artists like George Ruriman with Crazy Cat, a very simple situation, three characters, a strange surrealistic love story, and a lot of inventions in each page. A strange language. Comics as an art, in a way, with, with dialogue, which could be in James Joyce novels, and very difficult to, to, to translate or to understand incredible inventions during 40 years. It was never very, very successful, but the owner of the newspaper wanted to continue this crazy cat masterpiece. A painter like Feininger created comics in the beginning of the 20th century with two series, the Kinder Kids and We Will a Winking World, some pure poetic work it's not really a story. It's a way to arrange images together to give impression, emotions, a pleasure of color. It's art. And I'm always sad when I see a painting by Feininger in a museum that nobody mentions that he was also a major comics creator because he was an artist in both forms, not only as a painter. And it's the same universe. 
look how wonderful it is and, and the way you integrate the title and, and, and the text and some pure continuity. Uh, in some contemporary comics, we, we, we find the same type of thing. When a major, major artist recently rediscovered, especially by Chris Ware, uh, was Frank King, and he created this wonderful, extraordinary story called uh, Gasoline Alley. Uh, it's the story of an orphan and a man, the man is uh, Uncle Walt, and the boy is Kizik's. Walt finds this little boy in, in front of his door, and we will see the boy growing and becoming a big boy and then an adolescent and, and, and an adult. And each page shows one element of this strange and beautiful education. But of course, an education to comics. How to invent a specific space between two dimensions and three dimensions, of course, what he's doing, Uncle Juan, is impossible in a way, in a realistic point of view. But on the page, we understand it perfectly. This is a specific way to create comics. And here, this education to art, to colors, how to transform the landscape. Uh, this also is a perfect modern masterpiece. It was republished recently. It was forgotten for a very long period because the history of comics is difficult to tell because a lot of material was published in the newspapers and the newspapers were difficult to find. So we had more an history about the books than about the uh, magazines. Adventure, comics in the 20s, in the 30s, science fiction, fantastic story, historic story like Flash Gordon by Alex Raymond. But look how beautiful it can be. Just one single panel. If we stop on one panel, we see, oh yes, this is incredible. The use of black and white, the composition of the page. And we can see the same thing about another major artist, Milton Caniff. And uh, Terry and the Pirates was a long, long story. And it, it began with just almost nothing, but at a certain moment it became very intense, very dramatic, and with the use of composition, and sometimes very simple with a lot of white, and sometimes very sophisticated panels, and this page is very, very famous, and um, the death of a character, we go to silence, and people will so deeply moved that they wrote to Milton Caniff for years, for years, to say how sad they were to, 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 to see the death of Raven. A few words about Hergé. I'm a sort of specialist of Hergé. I was lucky enough to, to, to know the man. Not it, it was not like that when I <laughs> met him. It, it, it was 37, I'm not so old. I, I met him 40 years later, and this is the, just the beginning of Tintin. Very simple, black and white, with an incredible dynamic. Of course, it's not a style that we are used to, but it was already perfect in his genre. And he tried from book to book in black and white and then in color, to invent different things. For this story, The Blue Lotus, he worked with, with a um, Chinese student who helped him a lot. And every inscription, every text was drawn by Chang and has a meaning. Now Tintin is very successful in China and Chinese people can understand. This is um, by the uh, uh, Siemens. Um, light and here don't buy foreign products. You see, my Chinese is perfect. <laughs> um, this is the Black Island, first trip of Tintin uh, to the UK, and see how simple, how perfect, how efficient it is. These are the two first pages of the story. 
story. So many things happen, but in a very, very simple way. And he continued to progress, and he gave an epic dimensions with this specific story. He was using comics in so many interesting ways. For example, here, we, we think, when we remember the story, that we have seen the captain falling. But it was not necessary. It was not necessary to, to, to show it. Here, three images. But the real meaning is to consider the three images as one, to, to understand after so many years the new possibilities of comics, how to combine those pictures to tell something that no one of the image is specifically telling. Or here, in the quest of the poor Chang, lost in the Himalaya, and they are desperate. How could we find him? And the landscape is continuing in such a beautiful way. This was a sort of invention, and it was imitated. So many artists we could comment, and some were working for years only with a few characters, and of course the peanuts with four images a day. They entered in the memory of so many people, and they were part of their life, and they were as something like paper friends. Paper friends, it's a very important idea for the art of comic strip. And he also, in the simplicity of Charles Schuh's work, look how beautiful it is. With this female artist in France, Claire Bletrochet, we see we should see it more carefully, but we see that we can tell a story with only a few words, maybe only one word, and you can tell a story if you consider specifically the drawings and the small transformation. Of course, many pages of British use great dialogues, but it's, it's interesting to see that with some graphic variations you can do so much. Then we enter in the idea of the graphic novel. It was called in France, Roman en bande dessinée, a novel in comics form, in the middle of the 70s by Hugo Pratt. To give strong impressions, like a novel with characters, with, with deep emotions, with a lot of inventions also. And of course, when we speak about graphic novels, we cannot forget the art of Art Spiegelman, uh, this incredible and terrible story of Maus, which was so important not only as a masterpiece, but because it opened the doors of so many bookshops and libraries to comics and consider more seriously uh, comics. Of course, it's a story of his father, it's a story of the Holocaust, but it's also the beginning of autobiography, Art Spiegelman and his father, and the memory. Graphic novels can take different forms, and probably the work uh, written by Alan Moore for V for Vendetta, a watchman, were as influential as Mouse in a different way. And then we saw the possibility for comics to treat every subject, to treat very personal matters, like in this very, very important book, Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. Also autobiography, the discovery of her homosexuality, of the homosexuality hidden uh, of her father. A very personal uh, story, very literary story, and this book entered in the academic world as mouse. In, in France, an Iranian young author created Persepolis, Majan Satrapi. Very simple drawing, but a very strong story. In the United States, some people were inventing, inventing new forms like Craig Thompson with, with he came in Kendall some years ago. Uh, with such a subtle way to manage with words an image, to combine them, to use freely. 
with the form of the page, the double page, and the whole book, because it's a 600-page book. He continued with Habibi. He uses comics art as a natural language, as an evidence. Text and image combined in such a beautiful array, Arabic writing. In Japan, just one example with this story of Kubiko Nanana and the friendship between two girls, the love story between those girls, simplicity. To stop in a moment, to give an impression with only details, to use a page with no image, but with beautifully drawn text. And here, it's incredible. But of course, if you translate it, if you lose Japanese writing, Japanese vertical writing, you lose a lot. I show very quickly, in the last two minutes, three major artists. There are so many others. But just to give ID, an idea of the freedom in the use of comics. Here, by Richard Maguire, the story of one place through the years, through the centuries, the transformation of a place with a new way to include panels in the whole page. Incredible experience, something really new, a new way to invent comics. One of the contemporary genius, Chris Ware, incredible, working with images, working with text, working with very, very sophisticated pages. Believing in the possibility to express everything in comics, as in a movie, as in, in high art, as in a sophisticated novel. To give impressions that are not only the continuity, but different impressions coming at the same moment. And we have to reorganize it, like in our brain. Symbolic image, dreams, like in Tupfer Jabot. A book that is not even a book building stories, but a combination of 15 forms. Ah, extraordinary experimental wave, work. And last example, Emil Ferris, who created one masterpiece. My favorite thing is Monsters, using in a totally new way, the language of comics is said that it's the notebook of a young girl, a very talented young girl, of course, and she uses different type of language, different way of integration of text and images, and so the story is still continuing, and you can see how powerful are comics and that they really are a form of, of art, a specific form of art, because what they are doing perfectly, no other media could do it. Thank you. And <laughs> sorry to have been a little here. Um, well, we've got about five minutes before uh, it's Dave's turn, so I was wondering if I could ask you a couple of questions. Do you want me to hold the mic for the live stream? Now you have many books to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were saying, Benoit, that uh, comics do things that other media can't do, and I absolutely agree with you. But also, I wonder, with some of the innovations in the form, if you actually see the influence of other media coming in. So, for example, that page uh, by Winsor Mackay, where the elephant is getting closer and closer. Mackay was also a filmmaker, and that was made around the same time that we hear these apocryphal stories of audiences watching early silent movies and a train coming towards the screen and them running out of the cinema, which I think probably never happened, but is a lovely story. Do you think see things like that, you know, encroaching? Yes, um, Mackie worked also as a um, 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 theoretical uh, artist. He presented his films on stage and drew on stage, so he was a multimedia artist, and certainly there are a lot of influences. But the problem is sometimes people think that comics 
I have something under the movies and the, the best thing which can happen to a comic artist is to be adapted to, to movies. But I think that there were a lot of influences in both sides. I love also movies, of course, but I don't think that comics are inferior and they can invent something. Um, the image are shown together on the page, or on the double page. We have the freedom when we are in a book to look at it first quickly and carefully to, to stop on an image. And this, this is extraordinary. And also, we don't need so much money to, 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 to create a story. The example of Persepolis is incredible because we had this young woman deciding to, to, to tell an autobiographical story about her childhood. And let's imagine that she came to a movie producer and said, I would like to make an uh, uh, animation, a uh, long movie about my childhood. And people would have, nobody would be interested. But they, she created the book, the book was successful, and then she was able to transform the story and to make the animation movie. This is a freedom um, that we have now with, with comics. Everybody with patience and talent can create a story, and if it's a good one, it can be successful. Yeah. This, this is not the case for, for every form of art. If you want to create an opera, you need to convince a lot of people and to find a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Maybe there needs to be more comic book adaptations of opera to get the productions put on. Um, and then someone like uh, Feininger, um, you know, he kind of has dialogue with other kind of German expressionist fine artists, and you can see some of the rendering of what was going on in fine art in Germany at the time, then also turning up in his comics. And that's something you very rarely see, a dialogue between comics and fine art. So it's fascinating to see these historical examples where occasionally that does happen. Yes, and now we have a lot of comics artists presenting their work in art galleries or museums. And Matotti, for example, an Italian artist, he is also an illustrator, a painter. And I would say that the uh, frontier between high art and comic art uh, is, now, is now very close. And a lot of exchanges uh, are possible. And, and some comics artists are great, great artists even outside of comics, but they are also great artists in their simple and small pages. And there is also some modest art of comics like Charles Schulz, which is or Bill Watterson or other theories, which is very, very precious. So we don't need to have the idea that if you work that size, uh, it's just commercial, and if you create a large painting, it's art. This is a stupid idea. And when we look at some images that inspired Roy Lichtenstein, uh, we can see that there was already art in the single panels uh, created by those forgotten artists. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to think we're now living in an era where that prejudice is evaporating, because I interviewed Barbara, Barbara Nesson a few years ago, who's a fine artist who also does comics, and they showed her work at the V&A, and they showed work that clearly included her interest in comics, but nowhere in the catalog of the exhibition did they use the C-word, uh, comics, um, you know, to talk about her work, which just showed that there was still this prejudice in the art world, but hopefully events uh, like today, you know, at a, a major museum are showing that that prejudice is breaking down. I mean, obviously, you know, in Europe, we have the idea of the ninth art, that it is appreciated, but hopefully now, in Britain and other countries, it is also being recognized as such. Yes, indeed. Uh, Benoit. <laughs> uh, Benoit, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now very much invite Dave McKean to talk about his latest research into AI. Well, his integration of AIs, yeah. <laughs> Techie stuff first. Compatibility issues. <coughs> Yeah, uh, this is fantastic.
this is great, isn't it? Watching somebody unwrap my earphones. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't think I'd be standing here unwrapping earphones today. Right. Hello. Uh, <coughs> right, it's very hard to, uh, I, I mean, Benoit sort of covered my love of comics as well, so that's half of what I was going to say uh, dealt with. Um, so, uh, right, just some housekeeping first. Uh, how are new technological advances, especially artificial intelligence, offering new opportunities to define what it is to create, to draw and consume comics? No. I'm not doing that. Um, I'm not a sort of cheerleader for AI. Uh, so um, I will get to it. But I'm certainly going to start by just running through what I usually do in my real life before I wandered into this AI twilight zone that showed up a few months ago. Um, so um, I've been doing a... I was asked to do a retrospective book. So I have been looking back over my... I don't like looking back over my stuff, really. I like to just fun look ahead at the next thing, the next exciting thing. Um, but I have been tracking back over all my work, so it's kicked up my basic love of comics. I, w I was not a big reader as a kid, like lots of little boys, uh, but comics got me reading. And although, I mean, I couldn't really... Uh, these are the covers for the retrospective book. I couldn't really articulated at the time in this way. The thing that I loved about comics was it was a very generous medium. It only gives you half the experience. It holds back a certain amount of information. There is no motion. But a really good drawing can imply that motion. And you start to see how people speak and move on the page. And there is no sound. But a really good piece of illustration can evoke a place and an atmosphere and you start to feel that you're there within that story. And it's, so, it, it's a medium that invites you to create as well, along with the piece. And I really loved that as a kid, and that's what I still love about the medium. Um, so I'm just going to... These, um, these are some of my old art, art school projects that I track back right to my beginnings. The very first comics I drew uh, before going to art school and during art school with some similarly enthusiastic mates... There were, about, there were three or four of us who loved comics in the school. And we went to the printing department and printed our own books and sold them. Um, and taught me a lot. Uh, but this was uh, the first book that I did with, um, out in the real world with an um, author, struggling journalist called Neil Gaiman. Um, I had no idea what happened to him. Uh, and uh, he was uh, very good at putting his foot in the door, so we got an interview with DC Comics. Uh, but this was the first book that we did together. He'd written a, he was in a writer's group to learn how to write uh, fiction, and he'd written a little story called Violent Cases and gave it to me, and I'd been doing a lot of collage work in art school. And the book is essentially about memory and the fallacy of memory. And so I thought these... Uh, these sort of collage constructions was maybe an interesting way of evoking memory. You just get a, a sense of a colour and a texture and a, a face half seen. So that was my first sort of crack at dealing with memory in, in comics. So we, uh, we, I started working for DC Comics in New York. I had, the, this, I had two years doing uh, a couple of mainstream books. This is one of them. Um, this is me desperately trying not to draw Batman because I didn't really understand <laughs> what it was, um, a man who dresses up as a bat. Uh, I, it was one of those stories that I kept on thinking, there's the pages missing here. He's a kid. He witnesses his parents being killed. I can see how that would affect you badly. Um, he does very well in life. He thinks, this is my child. I've got lots of money. Now I can make a difference. And you turn the page and he's dressed up as a bat. And he's got... <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, so anyway, this is uh, Arkham Asylum, uh, and that led on to doing lots of covers for Neil's series, The Sandman. So I spent a few years at DC doing all this uh, sort of mainstream work. 
what I was trying to do, really, it was a golden opportunity because um, the comics weren't selling fantastically well at the time. And they'd, uh, they'd had a little luck with Alan Moore, who's been previously mentioned. And so there was this extraordinary chance to go in. The lunatics took over the asylum. Uh, we could say, don't worry, we know what we're doing. And uh, just give us a bit of money and we'll make some comics for you. And they were successful. And the main thing was we wanted to reach an audience that didn't usually buy comics. And so to do that, I felt we needed to speak in a language that was out there in the world that you'd see on album covers and book covers and film posters and things like that. So that was that. Still, still doing that until recently. I just finally retired from doing Sandman covers after 30 years. I've done enough now. Um, and then uh, there's another book with Neil, Mr. Punch, another memory book. Uh, most, most English children, I think, have a sort of vague memory of Punch and Judy. I certainly did. And we all remember bits. We all remember the, that's the way to do it, the funny little voice, and the dog, and maybe the sausages, and something about a ghost. Uh, but nobody remembers the plot. It's one of those things. You see it as a kid as one thing, but then you see it again as an adult. It's something else in in entirely. The plot of Punch and Judy is a man is left in charge of a child, uh, while the wife goes away and the child starts screaming and the man can't stop the baby from crying, so he kills the baby. And the wife comes home and she's not very happy about that, uh, so he kills his wife. And the policeman comes to arrest him for murder, he kills the policeman. It's a ruthless serial killer story, is what it is. Um, and uh, in, the, in the scene over here, uh, he's sentenced to death and the hangman comes to hang him. And he, in a great scene, he manages to convince the hangman to hang himself instead. Uh, and the final scene of the traditional script is the devil comes to take Mr. Punch to hell for his crimes. And he kills the devil. <laughs> and the last line is, and Mr. Punch, Mr. Punch is free to spread his words of good cheer to all the children. <laughs> this is wonderful. Um, so we had to do something with that. And the, 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 the key to it is this extraordinary contextual difference between seeing something as a kid... And then you see it again as an adult. You think, it can't have been that. I, that can't have been what I saw as a kid. Um, anyway, that's what we did. But the way I was dealing with memory in this was different to violent cases. I thought, actually, memory is like little film clips. You, you remember these little moments, these little slightly blurry passing moments. So I'm very happy using any technological trick in my comics. Photography is a perfectly good thing to use in uh, comic storytelling as well. So these were the little moments in Punch. Um, this was the first book I did on my own um, called Cages. Um, it's just about all the things that I was curious about at the time. Why, what we believe in, why do we believe certain things, what is creativity. Um, and... Uh, I was interested in real people. Uh, a lot of comics, re um, well, convert human activity to this sort of cipher of gestures and facial expressions. And I wanted to get back to what real people do, the way they speak, the way they start saying one thing and then get lost and go off and it's somewhere else, and the way their expressions betray what they're really thinking. All of those little subtle the humanness of, of uh, human interaction. So that's what Cages is about. Um, there were all sorts of little moments in it. Um, I left myself room to manoeuvre as I was planning it. So there was one point where the two main characters, a man and a woman, meet, and I was geared up to write that long conversation where you first introduce yourselves and get to know each other. But actually it came to it, and I kind of started that, but they were in a jazz club. I thought the thing that would conjure that best would be if they start talking and the music's playing and they just sort of get lost in the music and so the pages become just visual. They float up into the room. The music is around them. Everything becomes symbolic and everything floats. All the utensils float around the room and then they start... The, it actually is about 20 pages long. I'm skipping pages here. But everything just floats back down to the table and then at the end, 
Hours have gone by. They realise they're the last people left in the club and they've had this extraordinary bonding conversation. I'm sure we've had those conversations in our lives. Um, and I continue to love comics. I'm very happy making movies and um, I've directed films and edited, designed feature films, uh, written for the theatre, uh, do, made a lot of music. I spent a great uh, time here in Manchester making a project called An Apes, Pro uh, Apes Progress down at the uh, music school theatre with a great band. So I love playing around in the creative world, doing lots of different things, but I always come back to comics in the end. It is my first love. Um, just playing. The strip on the left is uh, a documentary piece about uh, Chinese AIDS villages, very big scandal. It was for a book of scandals. Uh, the one on the right is for an exhibition. This is a little story about called The Weight of Words, just uh, cued off my wife telling me something about one of the parents at school. And it occurred to me, as she said it, as I was taking in the information and, and, and saying, oh, that's awful, and it's terrible, as, as she was saying it, I was thinking, this piece of information is a boulder for that person. It's their life weighing over them. But I've been, just been handed this bit of information, and it's, it doesn't weigh that much. It's just a little thing. If I pass it on to somebody else, it's barely a pebble, you know, because they're not, they're not invested in the person's life. And I thought that was a strange little observation to have, so I made a little story about it. Um, this is a piece about my father. Um, and uh, he died when I was quite young. And uh, I've thought about his life and his story many times as I've been growing up at different ages. I'm now older than he ever was, which is a very strange thing to think about. Um, so that's that piece. Um, created in Photoshop with sculpture and stone. And again, I'm happy just incorporating any technology into the telling of the story. I tend to feel that whatever, whatever imagery is right for that particular story, what conjures the mood, what expresses the ideas in it the best, that's the medium to use. Um, this is a private little story I did for my 40th birthday. Comics remain for me quite a private thing. Um, I, I know they're often used to tell big demonstrative adventure stories, but actually, when you read the thing, there's just a little voice whispering to you, and I like that relationship. This, this personal, direct uh, voice on the page, but also visual language, and it feels very private and personal. And most of the stories that I've done have that intimacy. Um, I've done some children's books, uh, and I like, again, using comics whenever I can. These are with David Almond. Uh, this is a story called The Savage. Some children playing in the woods, and the savage is uh, watching them. And then there's a visual echo as he tries to dance as well, but remembers watching them. Uh, this is a story called Mouse Bird Snake Wolf, again with David Almond. A world created by lazy gods with lots of gaps, so these children fill in the gaps with their own creations. This is an idea forming in his head of the mouse. Uh, this is a very complex book called Joe Quinn's Poltergeist about, amongst other things, the loss of faith. Um, but I tried, again, lots of little uh, visual ideas for this. I was quite happy with this. A child has died, and uh, in the memory of her, she becomes the gap in between the comics and the border, just touching the shoulder of the mother. Um, this is a book called Varjak Poor. Um, about a cat that has to go off into the world to save his family and find a dog, even though it doesn't know what a dog looks like. But this big noisy thing coming at it must be a dog. Um, this is a diary uh, I did for the BBC. Um, a Syrian uh, refugee wrote a diary and I turned it into a little comic strip for their website. Um, something for Dostoevsky's birth, birthday for the New York Times, a circular story that never ends. Um, a long book with Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist. Again, very keen to get comics. Whenever I can crowbar comics into a project, I'm happy. Um, and uh, for a museum uh, exhibition about Prometheus in Chicago. I'll wrap through these because I've got quite a lot to get through. Uh, this is for a great drummer friend of mine, Bill Bruford. I've done 15 years of album covers for him. 
but if I can get some comics in there, I'm happy. And fortunately, Bill is happy to let me do whatever I like. Um, very nice to see Winston McKay uh, in uh, Benoit's uh, show. My favourite uh, of the great historical figures. Uh, he really was the man that turned comics into an art for me. I know there are, there are others who did uh, fabulous work as well. Um, this is for um, another one of my longtime collaborators, Heston Blumenthal, a great chef. Um, so at the table, a waiter comes to the table with, uh, takes an egg from behind the ear of one of the diners, cracks it into a flask and uh, turns it around a bit and then serves you bacon and egg ice cream. So Windsor McKay's work is all about transformation. So is Heston Blumenthal's cooking. Uh, and then this is a book I've just done with uh, Heston, so I'm still getting comics in there. Is this a cookbook? Um, these were pieces done for the government social care department. Um, comics are great at putting information across, so they were very keen to uh, exploit that. Um, this is a long book um, that I did recently, Black Dog. I've really I'm glad you mentioned Eileen. Eileen was uh, instrumental in setting up Black Dog. The best thing I've done, I'm very happy with this book. Um, I don't really like, as I say, like looking back over my own work, but I'm very proud of this book. Uh, Paul Nash was, I think, the greatest of uh, the war artists. He wasn't necessarily the best draftsman, but he came back with the most powerful images um, about what we do to each other in these appalling circumstances. His paintings are as... Uh, powerful now as, uh, as they were 100 years ago. Uh, so this was a commission from the um, 1418 Now Foundation, uh, a series of commissions across every art form commemorating the First World War. They wanted to do a comic of some kind, so I pitched this, seeing the war through one person's eyes. And Nash's work are essentially dreamscapes. Um, he's a landscape painter, but they're dream landscapes. So I decided there's a lot of biographical material about Nash around, so I thought I would make a, a series of dreams, and each one uh, pushes together moments from his life, from his childhood growing up, from his time in the trenches, and from his experiences as an artist trying to find his voice in the First World War. Uh, this is him growing up in the woods. Um, sharing anecdotes with his uh, fellow students at the Slade in the Café Royale, with war imminent. Each one is done in a style that I hope is right for that moment. Um, narrowly missing going to uh, being commissioned in Greece, where he almost certainly would have died uh, because he was uh, very ill, so uh, was held back. Um, the boredom of being in the trenches and using abstraction as a way of expressing that. Uh, he felt that his artist's eye saved him because he was stuck there and every little moment of green shoots that, that come up, he could spend time making that into a whole landscape and a whole painting. So uh, he and his brother were both artists and they both felt that their creative imaginations kept them going through, the, through those experiences. Uh, getting married just before uh, going off to the trenches, and uh, the first Zeppelins went by uh, on the evening that he got married. So in his mind, he turns them into that. His, his relationship with his father uh, turned into a chess game. He felt quite distant from his father, so uh, I turn that into this uh, metaphor running through this story. Um, one of his uh, compatriots, Eric Kennington, was a great uh, portrait painter. Um, and so he tells it, the stories of Eric Kennington in the style of the time, really, going to the uh, expressionist and uh, woodcut images that he created and that uh, was very popular at that time. Um, waking up, uh, having, having fallen in the trenches stupidly, he uh, ended up back in hospital, and this is him exploring uh, the, um, the forest of 
Forest of thorns and veins he finds in the hospital, in his imagination, uh, coming to terms with uh, what he's facing, stretching out, finding this little egg. And this is a sequence with uh, talking to Levat Fraser, who he befriended after the war. Fraser was a very colourful, boisterous character, so that's why he's expressed in this way. And then I ended up turning everything into uh, a musical performance. So the comic strips were turned into animatics. Um, the narrative was done on stage by myself and Matthew Sharp and my wife playing violin. And I wrote uh, an orchestral score and um, songs, a song cycle to uh, take us through the story. And then this is a recent comic, uh, Raptor. Uh, again, exploring this idea of iteration and memory. The same sequence appears several times, different styles. Um, and essentially, this, it's a story split into two. One is set in the late 1900s with a writer coming to terms with his wife's death. And the other one is a sort of fantastical story. And these two stories uh, rub against each other and uh, influence each other. Again, drawn in the styles that I felt were appropriate for those particular stories. Uh, and another uh, book that um, in the middle of at the moment, at the moment it's called Your Move. It's with a Spanish author, author artist called Jorge Gonzalez. And we just trade, trade images. So it's a different kind of storytelling. I, I, I make an image, send it to him. He responds to that, sends it back. So we have this little chess game going on. Uh, eventually we'll finish, but we're having too much fun at the moment. There's, there's no brief, there's no story. The idea is just to play. Um, I've done, I like doing exhibitions uh, occasionally, but especially narrative ones. This is um, a story told in a gallery, uh, a trip around the south coast of England where I live, following this... Uh, the disappearance of a woman's husband um, who strangely keeps on cropping up in artworks by other people. She spots him in a painting. She's sure it's him. So she gets in touch with the painter and he passes her on to somebody else. He's appeared in the background in a photograph. He seems to be appearing, wandering through an installation piece by Ian Sinclair. And, um, so he follows her. I won't tell, her, tell you whether she finds him. You'll have to read the story. Um, but it's nice doing these narrative stories in galleries. People come along, they're used to just wandering around the space, seeing a bunch of images separate from each other, but very quickly understand that there's a narrative going on. So go back to the beginning and then spend a much longer in there than usual following, tracking the story through. And we've had some really lovely, very emotional responses to the narrative. This is called The Blue Tree. Um, and then this is um, the last of those um, called The Rut. Uh, was in the pump house in London. And I had a lot of fun with this, using comics to bring you into the narrative and then splitting the story in the room so it heads off in the walls in different directions. Somewhere in that room was the truth, but it was really down to you to decide which path you felt was the truth. Um, in the middle was this strange object, uh, and there's some text on it. And you, there were masks and you could align your face up with the mask and the text would come together to tell you one version and you'd go around to another mask and the text would realign to create a different version of the truth. Um, but of course then you are playing the character, you're wearing the mask with the horns so everybody else in the room sees you as the main character. So I had a lot of fun with this. And there was a dead body behind the screen. Only some people saw the dead body so I earwigged on the conversations at the end. People saying, what do you think the dead body was about? What dead body? Um, and so that, there you go, really. I've, I've carried on making illustrations for books uh, of all kinds. This is um, Dostoevsky. Uh, having a very wonderful time uh, in this creative life, exploring different things and uh, making album covers, all sorts of things. So that's where I would normally end, but then this happened. Uh, I was doing an album cover for a friend of mine, Matthew Sharp. And um, I had been invited to be a beta tester for Mid Journey, one of the AI image creation programs. And I didn't have an idea really of what I wanted to do for this, a vague possible idea. So I fed in eight words to Mid Journey. You type in eight words. And a minute later, it spat that out. And um, 
I thought it was beautiful, really. It looks like my work. It looks like a strand of my work. Uh, and uh, it took me about half an hour to do the research to work out exactly how these image creation bots work. And, um, and then I spent a day on the floor in a sort of fetal position. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, obviously it's a very powerful tool for generating stuff. I refuse to call it art because art for me is a process. It's about many more things than just reaching an end result. So it creates stuff. Um, and... Uh, I could either just quit because, uh, you know, who's going to pay me to do an album cover now when uh, anybody uh, with all of the commercial pressures of getting something done quickly, on time, as cheaply as possible, could just endlessly type in into uh, an AI generator and get an infinite amount of possibilities for their marketing departments that always want hundreds of possible things to choose from because they don't actually know what they want. So this is a sort of marketing department's wet dream, really, this thing. So I thought I could either pack it in and become a beekeeper or something like that, um, and, or respond in some way. So I thought I needed to respond. I make books, I make comics, so I made this thing called Prompt in 12 days um, as a way of exploring the thing, exploring AI, showing my audience what it does, and, and then just asking a lot of questions, trying to, trying to make sense of how I fit into this and how we all fit into this future that we're careering towards, and, and what it all means. So I've set up three little um, uh, experiments for myself, really. Uh, the first one, I happened to be talking to another uh, author about Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. So it's in my head. It was in my mind at the time. So I took the fifth tablet of Gilgamesh, the most current uh, translation of our oldest story. This is humanity's oldest story. Um, and then fed the translation two lines at a time into the AI to return the narrative, which started as cuneiform stone tablet carving, this incredibly visually beautiful uh, tablets, impenetrable initially. We had to learn how to decipher them back into a totally visual language. And I was curious to see if from 2,000 years in the past, well, 4,000 years in the past, to now, whether anything of the story could survive that turbulence. Um, and it's been interesting. I, it, it, it looks pretty impenetrable to start with, but I've given it now to a few people, starting with my wife, of course, um, and just said, what do you make of that? Just go through it. Just say what you see. And it, I've been really amazed at how many key moments from the story they alight on and have survived. Anyway, so that's that. That's obviously the violent bit in the middle of the story. Um, and then the next piece um, was, uh, I wondered how AI saw us now. So I decided to feed one headline from my morning newspaper into the bot for a month. Uh, and these, this strange alternate version of our reality emerged. Um, when I started doing this, by the way, I, I happened to live next... My neighbour uh, has done a master's degree on AI. Uh, so I ran around to her and said, look at this thing. Um, and she said, well, what's happened is... It's gone off into the internet and it's probably found your images and uh, that's why it looks a bit like you. So I, don't, as I said, no, I did not put my own name in the prompt. I didn't use my name. I used very neutral words in the prompt. And she said, well, it probably knows your IP address. I thought, oh, Jesus, is that, is that a thing? Um, it turns out it's not a thing. But uh, it's enough to make, turn you into a paranoid, delusional schizophrenic. Um, so this is the uh, sequence of headlines. Halfway through doing this experiment, one of the um, Apple computer programmers was sent home on leave uh, because he reckoned his chatbot had become sentient. And that seemed perfect. That was, became the central moment for my little 
story here. So I tracked that story back for a starter. The first one here is artificial intelligence get smarter, is it game over for humans? And then tracked it forward to the next one. Um, lots of amazing images came out. This is Boris Johnson's food policy. Um, this, is, this was the strangest one for me. This was a headline about the Labour Party becoming the new uh, party for British values and patriotism. And look at that. It's taken the red from the Union Jack, the red flag, Labour's red flag, and wrapped up these figures in it, being wrapped in the flag. You know that expression, being wrapped in the flag, being overly patriotic. This is some kind of weird AI joke. This was the only one that I censored. Um, one of the headlines was about the Texas school massacre. And everything that came out of it, I tried many, about six, seven times to get it to render something other than these obviously squelched together photojournalism shots of teachers and pupils grieving. There's absolutely no way I could use that in my experiment, so I chose a different headline for that day. But what it tells you is, obviously, the AI has no feelings. It doesn't, has, has no feelings to hurt. It doesn't care about hurting ours. Um, the final part of it was um, this uh, little walk. I, took a, I, I usually go for a walk every morning, um, and this is one of my regular walks in Rye Harbour. I take my camera, I photograph the birds, and I go out usually with a problem to solve, uh, an image I have to find or a bit of writing I need to sort out. So I took all of these questions that I had about AI out on my walk. I muttered away to myself, trying not to look too mad to all the dog walkers and whatever that were out there, and worked my way through these problems. And I brought more questions back for the AI to render. I then rendered those images, and I took all of the photographs that I'd taken, including the photos of the birds, all of the rendered images, and fed them all through a different AI program, which retextures them all using the textures from one of my painting, paintings. So they all start to feel like they're in the same world, which is exactly how I felt at that point. I was losing touch with what was real and what was not. Um, I'm not sure what conclusions came out of that, but there, 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 are, there are some conclusions in there. I've continued to use AI as a tool because, apart from everything else, it is a, t there is a, it is a tool. It's also much more than a tool. Uh, so the argument that it's just a tool I, doesn't wash for me. Um, images for... This is a magazine about AI that's just started up. Uh, this is an album cover I did for a band called Delirium. I've regularly done album covers for them. I did this. They wrote back and said... Well, you know, it's nice, but it's a bit too fantasy. And I agreed, so I just did another one for them. Now, if I'd uh, painted that, I'd have been a week painting that. I would have been annoyed if they'd just dismissed it out of hand. But it took, a, you know, it took a couple of minutes to render it, so I just rendered another one. I'm completely conflicted about this state of affairs. <laughs> um, so, finally, I'm going to... I, doing a paperback version of this book prompt and because a bit of time has passed I did it about uh, five six months ago um, I'm, I wrote an afterward for the book so and I only wrote it this weekend so I thought I'd just read read you that to finish up if that's okay who is that woman over there the soulless gaze through button eyes, the putty white smoked skin, the raven hair, the cleft lip and vaguely Asian attire. I took part in a discussion at the Arnolfini in Bristol, arranged by and moderated by Tom Abba, Director of Digital Cultures Research Centre, about AI and its impact on the creative world. I took along some pre and post AI work to show, and I thought I'd begin with a provocative prompt to throw up on the screen as the audience arrived, the death of art. All the images the AI generated in response to that statement or question featured this woman, usually in close-up, staring back at me, impassive. I wondered if there was a well-known band or theatre group or something called the Death of Art that would prompt such a specific and persistent response. A quick Google coughed up nothing along those lines. She remained a question marker. After the talk, a lady in the signing queue told me she is embedded in the algorithm 
and it's either her or a nebulous figure with its back to us in a non-committal landscape that are the defaults for dealing with questions too high concept for the bot to scrape anything more particular off the floor of the internet. I still wonder who she is and why the slight deformations. This all feels like we're helping one of the coders deal with some deeply repressed psychological trauma. But this is already old news. More recent iterations of the software have abandoned her. The death of art now gets more allegorical responses. In fact, everything now looks more slick and finished than the strangely morphed bacon and clay world of deformed unreality that I summoned in the creation of this book back in mid-22. Now you get this. I wonder if this is machine learning in action or whether the coding is being changed and therefore we are given an insight into how much we are going to be reliant on, slaves to, the coders and their, for want of a better word, taste. I've now taken part in a barrage of online conversations, podcasts and discussions and watched as bewildered journalists try to work out what the hell's going on and why we should care. I'm very happy that so many people do care about this cordyceps that has started sprouting out of our collective con creative consciousnesses. The main issues remain as they were when I first became aware of the technology, and despite much heated discussion in the press, on current affairs shows, and burning down the below-the-line comments sections of antisocial media, nothing much has been added to the debate. It remains a powerful tool for generating curious and surprising stuff, and that stuff, when curated by interesting prompters, like my friends Mario Cavalli and Ryan Hughes, for example, can be genuinely engaging. It can be used as raw material for further collage or physical media work and can therefore be part of the creative process. And the downsides. Exactly what are the algorithms being trained on? Clearly, everything, which means a vast amount, no, all the copyrighted work that has been uploaded to the web in simpler times but which is still owned by its original creators. The sheer audacity of the moral vacuum that is the creator of Midjourney concerning their data set, there isn't really a way to get a hundred million images and know where they're coming from, is enough for any formal hearing, isn't it? If we'd only killed a few people, obviously that would be murder. But we've killed so many people now, we can't possibly know who they all are. So it's just not worth the court's time. But the court cases are beginning, and good luck to Sarah Anderson, Kelly McKernan, and Carla Ortiz, because even though I don't think there's any chance of returning any or many of the contents to Pandora's box, I do think the total lack of any forethought on the part of the radical tech fundamentalists has to be called out. The argument that it is just a tool remains hopelessly naive. It is a tool, but not just a tool. We're racing to keep up with the implications of how it will change society. The idea that it democratizes creativity is also utterly bogus. Creativity is already completely democratic. Anyone can pick up a pencil, write or draw something, sing a song. You don't need special membership of a club. These things are open to all. Just get on with it and enjoy the doing of it. I've been contacted several times about non-fungible tokens, another contemporary digital phenomenon that sounds to me like selling bottles of air. But it is, if it is possible to blockchain an image to prove its ownership no matter what turbulence happens to it online, then it must be possible to watermark AI activity to at least prove beyond doubt and conspiracy theorists that the photorealistic image of a beloved television news anchor in sexual congress with a koala bear is fiction, or that, fo or that photo of Elvis being abducted by greys or Ukrainian soldiers wearing swastikas, whatever depravity some human mind wants to conjure, is fiction. The Midjourney founder interviewed by Forbes opined, it would be cool if the images had metadata embedded in them about the copyright holder, but that's not a thing. Well, you made it. It's only not a thing because you failed to make it a thing. There have been some frantic frantically drawn lines in the sand in the illustration illust uh, annual sector with many, including the Society, of, sorry, the Society of Illustrators, American Illustration, Communication Arts, AIGA. Oh, man. Back to the beginning. Oh, no, we're not. Um, 
and most hilariously ironic spectrum, all refusing to accept AI images. Sometimes this feels to me like shouting traitor at the 1965 Newport Folk Festival, but of course it had to happen. Policing it, however, is a whole other kettle of pixelated fish. I was particularly proud of the art of Dave McKean, I didn't set that up, Facebook community, when after the first few AI images were posted, um, prompted using my name, I think assuming I'd be honoured by that, administrator Kevin Guthrie asked for the group's opinion on whether to accept AI stuff on the page and was met with a pretty much unanimous no. I'm glad the overwhelming majority felt that the difference was important. Most commenters said it should be somewhere else, maybe way over there in a box. We could call it Pandora. I spent an afternoon with writer and professor at Cambridge University, Robert McFarlane. This is us plotting using handwritten bits of paper, not a computer or device in sight. Um, just as he had been forced to get to grips with chat GPT essay writing AI, now available together with 12 or so alternatives for the discerning lazy wastrel on the interweb. They crank out C or D grade passes while the prompter catches up on a few more hours sleep. Not great essays, but still passes. Programmers issued a half-hearted attempt at a filter that spots AI activity with a caveat that it wasn't very good. It's an arms race, AI trained on AI writing to spot and tag AI writing. Insanity. I very much hope uh, this and this final little comic strip in the book will be my last words on this tedious issue, although I doubt it will be as AI becomes ubiquitous. I'm booked to chatbot with Ian Sinclair in March of this year to mull the subject. With Ian's mind engaged, I dread to think on the Ballardian dystopia in which we'll find ourselves. I have no doubt some bright spark will decide to train their pet AI on Ian's pro style, which is almost tailor-made to mimic, releasing endless rivers of C and D grade Sinclair psychogeographic liminal meanderings. All of the surface tension, none of the depth. In the meantime, I will continue to use AI as a means to a thoroughly integrated and reworked end on occasion. But mostly I'll be creating 100% AI free work with 100% AI free kite mark applied and I'll continue to hope that that means something. And uh, I don't want to end on a depressing note, so uh, here's a picture of a hedgehog in a paper plane. <laughs> Thank you. You've already gone slightly over your time, but I thought I'm perhaps... really sorry. I, no, no, no. I, I didn't time it before. Uh, before I, getting angry, I didn't time it. Get angry. Uh, <laughs> but perhaps the audience can indulge us by eating into lunch slightly. Uh, uh, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, one one does, question. Does the... Oh, well, can I... Three? Yeah, okay, go on. Um, does the Facebook group allow AI art made by Dave McKean? Uh, it does. <laughs> so it that's, does. That's the loophole. Yeah, I mean, it's a total minefield. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it, we, we are negotiating this. Um, but I think the negotiation is important. I'm really depressed by this idea that tech is just released on us like some sort of virus. Um, and that we have no uh, pushback or sense of a conversation here to say, to at least ask, is this the future we want? You know, is, is this, are these the decisions being made in little boxes in darkened rooms in San Francisco? Are they the right decisions? So I think these conversations are important, and I think it's important to be a participant, to be active in this. Thinking of provocations, which you meant, mentioned in your talk, uh, there's a comic that you did a cover for uh, about 25 years ago um, by Neil, as is often the case. Uh, one of his early issues of Miracle Man, perhaps his first, where Miracle Man is this godlike superhero, um, and pilgrims, as is their want, go up a mountain to ask him of things. And one person goes up the mountain and asks, um, one of my family members is dying of cancer, can you cure them? And he says, no. And the other one says, I have all these images in my head, I want to make art, but I don't have the ability to do so. Can you give me the ability to make art? And he says, yes. And it feels like, in a way, these kind of mysterious ghosts in the machine, oh, that's the hedgehog and not the woman, but um, are kind of empowering people 
who don't have the ability to make art to make art. So do you see that as some kind of liberation for people, but is it also terrifying, as you say, in your fetal, fetal position on the floor? Well, we all have the ability to make art. That, that is my point, really. Uh, what, what you're saying is, I want to be able to draw like Michelangelo immediately with no work at all. Um, and the, the, the point of art for me is not just an endless series of end results. It's the process, you know. It's the things you do on the way. I used the metaphor of going for a walk specifically and deliberately. Um, you know, the AI equivalent of going for a walk is just teleporting to your end place. Well, that's not a walk. Is it? it gives you nothing of what you want from going for a walk. It doesn't get you fit. It doesn't get your brain going. It doesn't get your muscles going, the blood pumping. It doesn't allow you to think you knew where you were going, but actually that path over there looks more interesting, so I'll go over there instead. The art is in the process mm. and the doing of it. Yes, you arrive at a series of points along the way and they are finished pieces and they go off and they represent this journey. Mm. But the art of it is the doing of it. And so if that gets lost, mm. this, this is why it's not just a tool. If that gets lost, if that's, our, if that's the way we're redefining what the nature of creativity is, mm then that's a major step to take. If we want to do that, okay, then that's, that's what we do. But I think we should really um, and, you know, look at the potential collateral damage of that seriously. I'm very interested in mental health. It's one of my big interests. And there's a big schism in the mental health world. If you've got a problem, it comes with a name and here's a pill. That's half of it. The other half say, that's a short-term fix, and it, it's barely that. Things like going for a walk, being creative, are a, most mental health is about lack of control. Actually doing, doing something like being creative gives you control. Mm. It may be a small piece of control, but for that moment and for that period of time, you gain control. All of those processes, the importance of actually making something, creating something, even gardening or, or cooking, any creative thing, mm. if that gets lost, in this strange redefinition, that's what I'm concerned about. Mm. So your God on Mount Olympus did give that person the ability to create. We can all create immediately. Mm. But I mean, thinking of mental illness though, I mean, in a way, when you're working with these AI images, it's almost like you're taking on the role of an art director who's commissioning someone to collaborate with you, but you're commissioning someone who's inscrutable and perhaps has some of the traits of a sociopath. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I mean, well, it, I, I'm not sure that it has any traits. I mean, what the, I've now made thousands of images now, and what you realise is you're dealing with... You, there is no intent there. So, I mean, on, on the chink of light for me is if you wade through the galleries on, online of this stuff, it eventually becomes just a, a sort of um, endless uh, nothing mm. because uh, there's no intent, there's no jokes there's no not really i mean I, I that one image that came up that i felt was a joke i made that joke it didn't mm. you very quickly realize that all of the real connectivity is still coming from the human side mm. it's um it's a, it, I, one of the metaphors i used in the book was of the film solaris well the book stanislav Lem, but the film particularly tarkovsky's film solaris some astronauts are in orbit around a sentient planet, and the planet just feels its way into their minds mm. and introduces bits from their life to them. There's no malice there. Mm. It's just a way of making contact. Dealing with AI felt like that. It was very hard to really make sense of it, to work out how sentient it was. Of course, it wasn't. Mm. But, but because we're human pattern makers, we, f we feel that... Uh, insistence of there must be a reason for this all the time. It's a very strange experience. I haven't really answered your question. Yet. No, I, I think you did. <laughs> I think you did. Um, cool. So we've okay. got uh, 50 minutes uh, for Sorry, lunch. Sorry, short now. lunch. <laughs> Slightly shorter. Um, obviously, don't disturb Dave when he's got a plate of food in his hand, but are you happy to answer questions if people want to come up to you and have a chat uh, in uh, the lunch break? Yeah. Uh, Benoit, same question to you. Do you mind if people come and chat to you in the lunch break and ask? Uh, 
Yeah, fantastic. Um, cool. Uh, we meet again in this room at uh, half past one, and there are some fantastic uh, panels this afternoon on research and what's going on in Europe. And then Dave and Benoit will be back again at the end of the day to talk about some of the themes that have emerged in the various talks. Uh, thanks again to all of you coming.
specifically African visual storytelling, and we want to be the home of all African stories. So that's what Kugali is. And what we do is, we have a few fields we focus on. We started off in comic books, and then evolved into augmented reality, and now we're in animation as well. So that's what we do. The aims of the workshop today is trying to get the kids to engage more in reading by use comic books. Stories are how we understand the world.
is. It's live now if you want to.
Asseyez-vous. Madame Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Andy Miles. I'm a professor in the sociology department uh, here at the University of Manchester. Um, Manchester Museum is actually part of the university, I'm proud to say. Um, and I'm going to introduce um, the session and um, uh, the speakers who, who are going to contribute to it. Comic Art Europe is a project which brings together four European organisations representing different elements of the comic book ecosystem, a higher education institution, festivals and a museum, with the aim of strengthening the comic book sector in Europe by experimenting uh, with collaborative working methods. The four organisations involved in Comic Art Europe are Escola Yoso in Barcelona, LICAF, the Lakes International Comic Art Festival in the UK, Lyon Bede, and the Belgian Comic Strip Centre in Brussels. There are several strands to Comic uh, Art Europe's project. Professional training, they, they provide summer camps and residences for artists. Creative assistance in the form of grants for project activities. Dissemination of the outputs from their their, their activities in Europe and uh, globally. And then the subject of this afternoon's session, research on the social impacts of comics, uh, is specifically the relationship between comics and literacy. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'm standing here as um, something of an imposter when it comes to comics. I'm certainly not a comics aficionado. Um, I ought to whisper this, but I'm actually not very interested in comics, per se. <laughs> I am, however, intensely interested in the way cultural tastes and practices are used to draw boundaries between social groups, particularly distinctions of social class. And here, comics sits outside of that set of mostly traditional art forms, and institutions which are counted as proper culture by the social elites that decide these things in the realm of what I would term everyday cultural participation. And my own research focuses on exploring the value and significance of practices in this realm uh, that is masked by narrow definitions of culture. More to the point for this session, perhaps, and my other related interest is in research methods so the different approaches and data we use to make sense of the social world, and which, far from being sort of neutral tools, um, actually help to construct that world. In an earlier part of my career, I did quite a lot of work with arts organisations uh, in applied social contexts, uh, such as with a, a dance company working with young offenders who were actually sentenced to dance. Um, here there was an assumption that the arts are intrinsically a force for good, with the potential to transform people's lives and behaviour, and that the job of research, or in that sector, evaluation as it predominantly called, the job of evaluation projects uh, was just to confirm this, really. Uh, the problem for me, uh, as an academic researcher, uh, was that the particular role and mechanics of the arts in such contexts was rarely isolated uh, or explained. And arts organisations weren't at all keen on being subjected to the kinds of research that might unpack that. So this is really why I was asked by LICAF, which leads the research element of Comic Art Europe, to provide some ideas and guidance to the research being developed by the uh, four Comic Art Europe organisations, partner organisations. However, by the time this had happened, the four projects were actually already set up and underway, um, some with similarities, 
but also with contrasting constituencies and settings, different ways of conceptualising literacy and using comics, and with different levels of research resource and experience. Therefore, it wasn't possible to develop a model framework which every project um, might adopt with a, with a view to making direct comparisons of approach and findings. But what we do have, and what we're going to hear about this afternoon, is four very rich and interesting projects which stand on their own and provide important perspectives on how and why comics can have impact in the field of literacy, particularly with disadvantaged and vulnerable groups. So, um, we have four projects to be presented, uh, around about 15 minutes um, per presentation. Uh, first, we will hear from Marie de Folco and Delphine Morinier from the Long Commune Organisation in Lyon. Then Tina Anthony um, from the Brussels Comic Art Museum will talk about the Belgian project. Third, uh, Sarah Garcia Ruiz and Jordi Semper will present the Catalan project. And finally, um, in the absence, unfortunately, of the LICAF researcher, Rowena Singleton, who can't be here today, um, I will talk about Rowena's work on the UK project. Uh, after that, we'll have a short panel discussion and Q&A, which, uh, Q &A, which Alex has kindly agreed to chair, hopefully to tease out um, commonalities in findings and shared learning from the project, and perhaps how we might uh, develop this work in the future. Good afternoon. So my name is Tina Anthony. I'm in charge of education in the Brussels Comic Strip Centre. Uh, we are a museum. If you haven't visited, feel free to do so. Um, welcome. Um, so I was um, the one accom accompanying the literacy project in Brussels. Um, of course, the situation was a bit different than in Lyon, where uh, Lyon Commune is a structure specialized in literacy training, uh, which we were not. So we had a partner structure with which we worked. Um, uh, and yeah, the project has some differences, but also a lot of similarities. Um, what, um, we worked with women. Um, our partner uh, was called Maison des Femmes, so it's the House of Women in uh, Molenbeek. So um, it was a focus on vulnerable, vulnerable women from migration backgrounds. It's a target group that is unfortunately quite present in Brussels. Um, and our um, research questions were actually asking if uh, these groups, how would they react to the use of comics in their courses? And specifically, um, I focus a lot on the attitudes towards learning, um, towards comics as well. Did they have a bias towards the me medium? Did they know at all? And how did it evolve throughout the project, before and after? Um, and uh, there was also a focus on well-being in learning. Was it something that they uh, enjoyed because there were comics in the classroom? Was it especially... Uh, something they liked and how did they uh, describe their feelings on the use of comics. Um, I was hoping to, to have some tests, to run some tests on formal literacy as well, uh, to see if there was any progress made, but unfortunately this has proved very soon to be uh, totally impossible because um, the trainers uh, told me that they actually never passed any tests on the women because they completely tense up in these kind of situations. Uh, they, they hate exams, they, they, they don't respond well. So if there's any testing, it's always done uh, discreetly. Uh, and the women don't know they are tested, actually. Um, so which means that there's very few data available on, on a normal uh, learning process in this structure. So we couldn't compare anyway. And, and it would be very difficult to, to run these tests. Um, so up, that was gone. <laughs> Changing colors again. Okay, so this is a, a picture um, from the workshops. Um, Maison des Femmes. You can already have a bit of an image of the groups. Um, 
Um, so our partner, Maison des Femmes de Molenbeek, um, it's a structure aiming at the um, emancipation of women, specifically women. Uh, they have four axes of work, so they have um, something they call social permanence, so it's uh, social care, really helping out with administration all kind of tasks uh, the women struggle with. Um, so um, also uh, towards uh, professional uh, reinsertion, um, literacy courses in French that are very important, um, and there are also a range of other activities such as sports, uh, activities with children, mother children, um, many, many things. Um, so it's an, uh, a structure aimed exclusively at women. Uh, it's a safe place for the women. Very often, uh, teachers told us that uh, the women, um, apart from doing shopping for their households, it was their only um, excursion out of the house during the week was coming to Maison des Femmes. So it's a safe place. It's a place where they can go. Um, their husbands, their families agree that they come to Maison des Femmes. Um, we had two uh, interventions group Intervention groups, I'll get back to them later. So in total, it was 32 women. Uh, and in, uh, we did a second project in uh, 2022 um, with only one class. So this is the place. They have also a gardening project, as you can see. Um, so some information about the, the, the women. Um, we uh, covered a sample of 75% in the interviews, um, so 27 women. Um, they were mainly residents from the uh, municipality of Molenbeek, which has sadly become quite famous uh, because of the Brussels uh, terrorist attacks. But it's just a rather poor Brussels municipality. Um, we know that the people usually have um, low income, low socioeconomic status, uh, um, there are some, it's, it's a bit of a problem with facing many, many challenges and problems. Um, the women were also quite old. This is, uh, I think, also uh, important. Uh, they uh, were usually first generation migrants, so they were in, in their home countries and they never had any schooling or very, very little schooling. Um, but most of them had been in Belgium for a long time, which means that I have been in Belgium and they didn't get oriented towards literacy courses before, and they ended up finding this place, this safe place, quite late. Um, so they were in Belgium for 15 years on average. I even had one uh, um, lady who was for uh, 51 years already in Belgium before she started her literacy training. Um, well, no, she didn't start, but she started quite late anyway. Um, so. They usually had done a few years or semesters of uh, training already. Um, a vast majority of Moroccan origin. It's a bit different. It's pretty homogenous, actually, um, the population. Uh, there was only one uh, lady from Nigeria. And as you can see, there was only three women with a certificate of uh, basic education, so the primary school. All other women never went to school or very little, only one, two or three years. Um, yes, um, all participants are unemployed, they're usually housewives, um, only eight have a working spouse. Um, there were, however, some difference, differences between the classes, and I'll also get, uh, tell you a little more about the, the levels. So the first class is the one, uh, so it's a, uh, it means o, O2 LE1 is Oral 2, Lecture, Écriture 1, so oral um, proficiency 2, which means that they could at least say a few phrases and, and sort of manage uh, to get themselves understood in French. Uh, and uh, reading and writing uh, 1, uh, which means that they can't write on their own um, uh, independently more than five words. Um, so it's a very, very low level. And we had four women in the class that had been in the class for seven years and didn't progress anymore. So uh, a lot of uh, learning problems uh, in that class. Um, also quite uh, interesting was that in this class there were many women that were either divorced, and they faced some stigma for that, of course, um, and, uh, or widowed, so, so a bit more isolated situations, I'd say. The other class, the, they, they, some of the women go from one class to the other and 
others stay for a longer time. It's, it's, it depends a little bit on the situations. Um, in the other class, there was more of a feeling of progress um, and the women knew um, how to read slowly some new sentences, new phrases. Um, so um, it was more, there was a positive feeling, more positive feeling in, in the second class. Um, so what did we do? Um, before um, the, the workshops, um, I uh, made a nice survey uh, that was handed out to the participants and I very soon, naively, I thought they would uh, complete it, but of course they didn't complete it because they don't have the skills. Um, so uh, I ended up doing everything by interview, almost. Um, so. Uh, which took quite a lot of time. These were individual inter interviews before the workshops. Um, and afterwards we did collective interviews, so because I, it was very time consuming. It was in uh, groups of, um, uh, small groups, usually four or five women, some, sometimes a little more. Um, in 21, we did five one morning uh, creative workshops. So we had a female artist, Juliette Bouton. So it seemed logical in this context that we would work with a female artist. She's very also uh, uh, socially committed. Um, and uh, she did the creative workshops with uh, the women. And in 22, we did uh, also creative workshops with the same class, so we could build on the, f the experience from the year before um, and some reading exercises. Um, we also had a small uh, comic book library with comics we thought simple enough, so they were either wordless or um, with very little um, texts. But we saw in 21 that the comic book was, a, uh, as a medium, as a support, was too difficult to access for the women. So they, they really didn't, they never touched the books. Uh, so we worked with one page comics, actually. Um, and then we also had feedback from the trainers and um, we had the attendance lists as well uh, from the workshops. So there were quite a lot of challenges. I've already um, touched on some of them. Uh, it was uh, the context of the pandemic, of course. Um, so uh, teachers were sick very often. Uh, the women were sick or had to take care of their children that were sick. sick. Um, so that was uh, quite difficult. I also, uh, one of the two trainers um, in the 21 project, uh, she, when we started the project, she was employed by Maison, by Maison des Femmes, then she became a volunteer. Uh, and then in the end she didn't work anymore and she was replaced by another teacher who didn't follow the project from the start, so this made it all a bit more difficult. Um, but the, the main, uh, we also had no control group because we had only one class on every level, so we couldn't have parallel classes to see what was going on. Um, but the main problem was really collecting data with these vulnerable audiences, as I said. The only uh, means w uh, I had was taking time for interviews and listening and have some kind of a, uh, an analysis of, of the discourse. Um, sometimes they didn't understand what I was asking uh, and Maison des Femmes also provided a translator for some of the uh, interviews. Uh, sometimes uh, I got the impression that they really gave me the answer I, they thought I'd like to hear, so um, that was also definitely um, part, even if I really stressed that I could talk out freely if, f about negative experiences as well. In 22 then, uh, the situation got even more difficult uh, because uh, the women um, who were, were, there were a lot of women uh, who quit uh, the course for various reasons and other women who did not want to take participate in the interviews anymore um, because they were in all kind of legal procedures and it was just another procedure and it was just too much. They refused to take part. Uh, so I had only four women taking part in 22 in the interviews. So I did not really include it in my results. Um, the workshops then, we had similar methods to the uh, colleagues from Lyon. Um, these women, of course, they, um, some of them knew comics before the project or had some, read some comics in Arabic during childhood, um, but um, it was rather exceptional. 
some of them had seen it, but only three told that they might have read something uh, of the kind. So it's, most of them didn't really know and, and definitely didn't know about the, 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 the reading direction or speech bubbles and, uh, and we really had to introduce the medium and we used all kind of similar techniques. Um, <coughs> afterwards, we, um, when we thought it was somehow introduced, we uh, moved on to creative workshops and Juliette asks the, uh, the women uh, first to tell a personal story. It was always based on personal experiences. And uh, we worked around uh, positive feelings or positive memories, always. Um, so they uh, made comics, about one-page comics, about an eyes encounter, feeling ridiculous, my first travel, my biggest dream. These were the themes of the comics. Um, in 22, then, we also visited the museum, which was uh, a nice experience as well. Um, we did some one-page comic uh, reading exercises, um, and we also included all of the comic in uh, an uh, end-of-the-year exhibition. They have this tradition of closing of the year, and all of the workshops, uh, poetry, uh, uh, all kind of things they do in the classes, they are presented and they have cakes and tea, and there's dancing as well. I danced as well. Um, so these are examples. Uh, this is a comic the women particularly remembered. Um, it's a comic uh, that Juliette, especially for the workshop, has uh, drawn. Uh, it's a domestic situation, so we're really in, in, in something they know. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the wife, she's working, she has to take care of the baby. Um, this is what comics can do as well. Uh, this is comics langu language as well. And this was something they really remembered. I mean, the husband is taking care of things. That's, that was quite something. Um, this is, I also had an intern who uh, made some drawings during the workshop. Um, these are a few of the comics. Uh, we see uh, Khadija. Uh, um, who says that she uh, likes uh, cakes, she doesn't like cleaning. Um, so that was presenting yourself in a comic and, and also you can see that she, she masters the speech uh, balloons. Um, the other one is about my first uh, travel. Um, so uh, Habiba, who says that she uh, has made a trip with her family, uh, Tetouan, and that she liked the flowers. So we got these kind of very simple, we're far away from the examples from this morning from, from Dave McKean or Benoit Peters. But anyway, these, this is comics as well. This is creativity. Um, uh, this is uh, Jamila, who says that she has two dreams, uh, learning French and traveling. I could uh, um, go to any country and I'm, I like uh, flowers and the sea. So that's about the the stories we got. Um, but they were very proud of it anyway. Um, another story, uh, it's a bit more uh, in reality, I'd say. Um, it's, uh, I don't have her name. Uh, her biggest dream is that she uh, will heal from her um, back, which hurts a lot. So she wants to have live without pain. And she wants to go to the beach. Um, this is an example of one of the comics we used. Um, so it's, uh, again, very much, we had a lot of situations about education and, and family life. Um, so very simple comic. I must say that the women did not particularly remember. They have a lot of memorization issues, problems, and they did not remember at the end of the project that they had read these kind of comics. Um, so maybe we, we, we would have had to do something more challenging, challenging but this, this didn't seem to work so well. But when I was in class doing the exercises with them, we saw that they actually got their information from the context and that they, um, I was an external observer, I was not a trainer, but I saw that they read quite fluently um, in the first, the lowest level. So this is the end of the year presentation where everyone is looking at each other's comic and having some fun and some laughs. Um, so um, 
just maybe to uh, to get a bit to the conclusions. Uh, in reading behavior, we had little or, uh, or no changes because the women, uh, they don't read outside of class. Uh, they pretend to do so, but when, when I ask them, but the teachers say, no, no, don't be fooled. They don't read outside of class, except for their shopping lists, maybe. Um, so they didn't, read, they didn't read the books, but at least they, uh, I, I don't think there were any changes uh, over there. Um, I also asked them uh, before and after how they feel when they read and write. Um, so um, we, uh, I saw especially uh, the women express uh, it's difficult. It's very difficult. It's heavy. It's uh, it's it's a struggle. Um, it evolves posit positively. This this uh, attitude if they make some progress. Of course, the women who stay on the same level, it's difficult. Uh, but they are determined to uh, to enroll for the next course. Uh, that definitely, they always speak about mental blocks. Uh, my head hurts. It hurts so much. I can't remember anything. And they look at the board. They see the word. They write it down, and they already forgot it. Um, not for all of them, but some, some at least. Um, so the attitude towards comics, it was rather positive in absolute terms, but we saw, and I think it's important for anyone trying to introduce these methods, that some of the women um, worry when they need to uh, draw or instead of read and write. They like the reading and writing part, but they are there to learn. They want serious learning. And for them, uh, literacy training is based on diligent, serious study. It's not based on uh, sharing, having fun, and laughing. Um, so, so they're a little worried. Do we have enough time? Uh, I don't have enough time. I think I'll, I'll have to quit. Um, but uh, there was a clear uh, indication. Uh, many of the women said they um, it, it did them well to go back to childhood. And yeah, you can read it out. So I'll to move on. Uh, okay. Um, for us, um, we are also extending the literacy programs with the museum. So I did a second uh, outside Comic Art Europe, a second uh, program uh, the end of last year. There are some lear learnings. So definitely in a group with a low level, you shouldn't come with a comic book. You should work with one page uh, or even just a few panels. Um, uh, mixed reading and, and, and creative exercises. So make sure we work on this progress, on this literacy training as well. Um, and um, also, uh, we, we, or we're, we are only starting to take comics seriously. Um, it's uh, from these people, they often see it as something for children. Uh, so um, it can have a bias. So it should be, we, we should be aware of it. Um, and we saw it that it worked really well working for uh, on uh, positive feelings with the women. So positive experiences because uh, it's women that face many problems um, in their lives. And it's if they have a moment of well-being in class, I think it's really something um, we can bring to them. And it helps them even in learning. So that's it. Next, we have uh, Sarah and Jordi. So, hello. Um, sorry, neither Sarah nor me uh, can speak English, actually. Uh, so, our translator. Uh, um, is not here because he's in, in Barcelona because they can, cannot uh, came. So um, it's a challenging for us to uh, explain uh, our project. So we try. Uh, if not, um, Tina, Tina is uh, gently offers to translators from from Spain. From Sp so we can try. Uh, um, I am uh, Jordi Sempere. I'm working. Um, as a teacher, as a scholar, Joshua, as a, uh, a specific uh, comic school in Barcelona. 
and um, Sara is a student uh, final degree as uh, social uh, education and uh, he, who works uh, with especially uh, homeless uh, people as a, as a final, final degree um, project. So, okay. <laughs> I'm going to start with the context. One second. Um, homelessness is the hardest evidence of redemption, residential exclusion and poverty. Having a home is what allows us to organize and base our lives. Is it essential for us to be able to develop as people and, of course, a fundamental right? Um, the actual reality of homeless is alarming and it's that. Um, this data is from 2019, so it's before the COVID. Homeless is a very complex phenomenon. There are many causes and factors that can lead a person to become homeless. We can find multiple reasons, such as economic, institutional, psychological, due to, issue, due to health issues, family, or losing a job, um, which can end up becoming a stressful life events. And the sum of the few of these can lead to a, a person to, be, to become homeless. And other questions that arise are like, why are the majority of homeless people men? We have a 90% between a 10% of women. And also, where are these women in the public shelters and hostels? Like, again, 70% between 30%. So the question is, where are women? If the risk of poverty and social exclusion is higher than men, and in addition, to the oppression and lack of rights that women suffer. This is because, on one hand, homelessness is a very tangible, has a very tangible and obvious part, such as sleeping in the streets, but on the other hand, has an invisible and very difficult to access and analyze part, like living in insecure houses or living in inadequate houses or unsafe. Also, women live more stressful life events in shorter period of time and when they were younger. In this type of homelessness um, is where we can find women, turning gender into a factor that characterizes this phenomenon. Also, with, with, also with this added vulnerability, we also can find some others, like having gone through a migration progress, process. So, this work emerged from the, from the interest of making an in the interdisciplinary approach between social education and visual art in, on, in order to enrich process and results. In this case, studying how the plastic arts can help to transform and give visibility to very complex contexts, such as those of homeless people. Furthermore, trying to look at this phenomenon from a gender perspective, as it changes the characteristics and consequently the intervention. So the main goals are, um, well, this theoretical review is materialized um, on one hand in a book presented as a col collaborative comic book that exposes and denounces this fact. Um, and also the album is complemented by a dossier of portfolio that details in depth what it means to not have a home and aims to place the reader in this context. Also, the album and the portfolio can be read independently, they are complementary. So, in short, <laughs> this project seeks to highlight the circumstance of this woman, vindicate their identity, and furthermore, to denounce a reality that doesn't have doesn't been given much attention. Uh, so, these are the goals. On one hand, um, the purpose of the project is to join a group of women in a situation of homelessness in this process of reconstruction, of reconstructing her own identity and recognition while exposing and denouncing the reality. And on the other hand, uh, design a portfolio that contextualizes the picture book. So it's, it's not a similar, it's not a literacy project at all, or not, uh, uh, um, the most important part, but uh, recovery their identity 
as a, a whole citizen, because the homeless uh, tends to um, yes. evita, evita. avoid avoid the, their, their whole persons. It's uh, just a low, low level, 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 just uh, to finish at the, at the, at the streets. No? So recovery their identity is important for, the, for, those peop for these people and uh, explain their lives and uh, find someone who, uh, um, who, who wants to learn their stories. It's important for them. So the, um, the, 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 the main process is um, if you just uh, write the, the story, just explain the story, there's not, uh, it's difficult for, that, for those people. But uh, um, when, when you demand their uh, drawing about this life, it's a difficult, uh, it's, it's a different approach that um, tends to uh, make uh, some sample, some uh, Mm, some, this this uh, intuitive approach is the, the, the word I, I am searching, because um, there are no uh, just uh, just explain the things that happen. It's more important just just construct a, and go a whole story and uh, a real story or a serious story. That's the, that's one tool. It's, in, it's in very important. And the other thing is uh, the fact uh, the, the fact that the drawing is just a very, very different approach to uh, explain the stories. And the fact of drawing together is just a, a, a very, very important thing because uh, you are in, it's, it's a thing that uh, the people who draw understand. And when you draw with another person, with draw in, in, in the same uh, table with another people, just uh, seeing how the, the, the drawing is, is elaborated, uh, seeing how uh, the, the things happen it, it's, it makes an um, atmosphere, a relaxing atmosphere, a collaborative atmosphere that lends to, um, to more um, sympathetic, more sincerity. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, difficult, different approach to explain those stories. And that's the, 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 that's the project, that's, the, that's the, 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 the basis of the project and the workshops. Uh, uh, she did uh, with uh, with this woman. So um, during the project, we do uh, first um, part of um, revision and revision of literacy, and then the intervention, and then the elaboration of the album and the portfolio. Uh, we made uh, three introduction meetings. Uh, six workshops and one assentment meeting. And the intervention that we imagine were like, well, the first meetings, um, we um, go to the uh, scenario, um, we made a gradual introduction um, for establishing a link and preparing a, a familiar and comfortable space. Uh, the workshops were um, planned with two hours or three hours, um, so we had enough, enough time uh, to uh, try, practice, uh, allow the wrong things that, well, error. Mistakes. <laughs> Mistakes. <laughs> um, and then we give them various materials, and our intervention were, was um, so minimal. So we um, cannot do a lot of photos because of the um, space and the, well, we cannot, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, no podíamos hacer muchas fotografías. No, we, we're not allowed to take uh, pictures of those people because it's a stress uh, spell. For privacy. For privacy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they didn't want also. So that was the final album. And, well, the conclusion. Well, the, the, 
the, the, the interest is the, 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 uh, the final album is just uh, explain all the stories and uh, explain the story of the workshops. It's Sarah herself who, uh, who draws herself as a mediator with this woman because um, it's important to this woman, um, to this woman, uh, explain their story, but also explain their story this is one this is a story to to, to people you know? so uh, it's important to to have a book who explain uh, all the stories all the all, all the situations uh, as a, uh, in a form which is uh, um, easy to to learn about to, all, all these uh, problems And also the portfolio um, includes what woman they wanted, that is um, a research of what does it, well, a research that they write by their own about um, the research housing, gender, and the process of migration. And that's all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I know you've been listening for a um, considerable time, so uh, I'll, I'm going to try and move through this quite quickly. Um, this is about the UK element of the Comic Art Europe project, which was led by LICAF, um, and it focused on the relationship between comics and children's literacy, and it was based in a primary school in Manchester. Um, as I explained earlier, the person who, who carried out the research and whose presentation this is can't attend, that's Rowena, Rowena Singleton, who was at the time a librarian at the school um, and sort of embedded her research, uh, bringing people together um, in a very rich project, which I'm not going to be able to do justice, but I will do my best. Um, okay. So, um, in the UK, literacy is widely accepted as the foundation for learning, uh, while literature is believed to support many aspects of children's personal uh, and social development. Reading is a key area of the Ofsted inspection framework, uh, and one that requires improvement in many schools, particularly among children in deprived circumstances. Yet, whilst educators continue to look for ways to improve reading results and develop robust reading cultures, uh, comics aren't widely accepted as the tool for this job. Um, so, that's the background to the two-year study um, that was carried out to explore the potential of comics in the classroom and at home to enhance children's experience of reading and consequently their happiness and self-esteem. Uh, a national priority at the time uh, in the, um, during and in the wake of the pandemic, of course. Um, so this is the sort of starting research question for, for the project. Um, Field size, as I mentioned briefly, um, uh, the part, main partner was Abraham Moss Community School, which is a state school in uh, northwest Manchester. Um, it's an ethnically diverse school with a relatively disadvantaged student body. Many speak English as an additional language, and there's a higher than average uh, uh, proportion of children supported by uh, the pupil premium funding. Lower key stage two pupils were selected as the target group for this study. Uh, on the basis of them already having uh, necessary phonics and comprehension skills to access the literature uh, and accompanying activities uh, uh, that were provided. That stage refers to children in um, years three and four. Uh, I always get a bit confused because I didn't do that uh, numbering when I was a kid. Um, uh, uh, of their educational careers, so that means aged between seven and a half and nine and a half. Reading is a whole school priority, Abraham Moss, and there's a huge variety of initiatives to support reading for pleasure. Many literacy provisions are in place for the range of learners, but reading is still an area for improvement. Uh, year three teachers shared uh, that there are gaps in parental engagement, and in some cases too few opportunities for reading at home, um, which is one of the reasons why um, Likaf partnered with the Phoenix Comet, uh, a weekly um, subscription comic um, and introduce that to the project, and I'll just explain that in a minute. Um, I won't 
spend too much time on theory. There is a wide body of theory, people will be familiar with this here, I'm sure, that defines a clear and positive relationship between comics and literacy. It's argued that comics can build comprehension, inference and language skills while enriching knowledge uh, in every subject area, not just for those children who struggle with prose, uh, but for higher uh, ability children too. Uh, in addition to uh, the benefits to formal literacy uh, uh, learning, it's claimed that making comics helps children to link the process of thinking, drawing, writing, and encourages them to express themselves in different ways. Um, so our kind of potential outcomes framework uh, was developed from the reading agency framework uh, um, for enjoyment for reading. And you can see the, the sort of indicator areas um, shown there. Um, and it was then anticipated uh, that increased reading engagement would lead to a positive impact on people's creativity and well-being in addition to those enjoyment for reading outcomes. Okay. Unlike the more um, open and fluid research context we've heard about in the other Comic Art Europe projects, working with a school offers a more structured and controlled environment. So here there was a possibility to implement um, what I guess one would call a quasi-experimental research design involving two broadly matched groups um, containing uh, 27 and 26 pupils, year three starting, then going into year four. Um, and one, one class received the comics intervention um, uh, and, and the other in this frame did not. Um, and of course, there's an ethical dilemma with that, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, the school were very cool about it, apparently, and uh, it's not unusual uh, 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 for kids to get different learning pathways. But um, in order to mitigate that, um, it, the, uh, the, the, the kids in the non-intervention comparison class were given a subscription to the same comic after the workshops had finished. Um, the intervention uh, lasted um, for over two academic years. It took the form of 40 half-day workshops uh, for delivery across those two academic years by two LICAF producers, one of whom's here, Hester Harrington, the other is Sim Leach, both qualified teachers. Oh, Sim. Hello, Sim. Um, and eight professional comic creators and con with contrasting backgrounds and specialities. Um, um, and so along, um, and along with the subscription to the Phoenix Comics, with the, which the intervention group got during um, the workshop phase, um, they were also supplied with a travelling library of comics from LICAF. So the objectives of the first set of workshops, which ran from April to June 2021, to, were to understand the basic, 2021, were to understand the basic mechanics of comics, and develop confidence in drawing. Um, in the second stage, from November 2021 to May 2022, increased opportunities were offered to model reading and read comics communally. Um, there was access to the school's secondary phase libraries and comics collection. I think there was a mini comics festival put on, so a whole lot of development activities, really. Um, data were collected continuously during the workshops and included informal observations, samples of creative work, written feedback sheets, and photography and, photography and film. Um, at, un, at both the mid and end points of the study, pupils in the intervention um, group and the class teacher were interviewed about their experiences and a focus group was held with workshop leaders and visiting artists. A supplementary interview was also conducted with the teacher of the um, comparison group class. At the end of the project, all pupils and parents were asked to repeat the initial online survey used for baselining, uh, featuring a small number of additional questions, and access was again granted to the school's own reading assessment data. So here, there were two kind of qualitative elements. One was, was developed by the project around the, the, the um, indicators for enjoyment of reading and creativity and well-being, uh, as was set out. Um, but there was also this, this sort of independent uh, assessment of, of literacy development that the school routinely carries out. Um, so you have that comparison, and then there's a bunch of qualitative work done in the middle of these things to try and make sense of findings as they emerged, um, and any patterns in the quantitative data. So I'll move on to those now quickly. Ooh, another one of those. Um, 
reading behaviour. Um, well, I think this is probably, in terms of the quantitative data, the key, the key finding. According to the data supplied by the school, the average reading age of both the intervention and comparison group at the start of the project in March 2021 was just over 6.5. When tested 12 months later, two months before the final workshop, the average reading age of the comparison group had risen by 11 months, whilst the average age of the intervention group had increased by 18 months. Uh, a gap was also evident in, group, in the group's year five readiness in reading in May 2022, um, with 60% of the intervention group being assessed at year four, secure or better, in contrast to 45% of the comparison group. So a clear, a clear difference. Um, and um, you can see uh, here a, a sense that, um, that the children in, in, in um, trying to make sense of what was going on themselves are expressing a sense of, uh, that they are getting better at reading. Um, attitudes to reading. Enjoyment of the reading of reading rose amongst both groups, but considerably more among the intervention group. A large majority agreed their, that their feelings about reading had become more positive, and both they and their parents spoke enthusiastically about receiving uh, and reading the Phoenix. So um, this is Zion's parents talking about um, the impact on their child. The class teacher also noticed a significant shift in positive attitudes to reading-based activities more generally. That's the subject of the second quotation. Um, and that this positive attitude transferred to learning more generally. She noted that sequential art helped break down complex material. And in terms of the students' response, there was a complementary rise in the percentage of students feeling that comics had made reading less difficult. So one of the, um, okay, some quotations here um, that you can read. One of the indicators of um, identifying as a reader was, was, had, was taking pleasure from me given a book. Um, so that was one of the indicators under, the, under this heading. There was an uplift of 13 percentage points in pupils strongly agreeing that a gifted book would bring happiness in the intervention group and a relative decline of 14 percentage points in the comparison group. Identifying with content was a key step um, to pupils identifying as readers themselves, and here you've got ex uh, examples of that. Um, pride was expressed by students in what they produced personally in their own comics and as a group in terms of the mini comic festival and so on. The class noted that several less obvious, as she called them, children, namely boys, uh, who would usually express a disinterest, started to step forward uh, and were very excited to present their work and be seen as reading role models. After the workshop had finished, the number of children who listed reading as one of their favorite leisure activities doubled in the intervention group, whilst it dropped down the ranking in the comparison group. And here you can see that some people sort of got an intrinsic motivation to read more, um, such as Nabila and others, um, uh, like Liam discovered, discovered reading as a, as a form of escapism. So 14 months on, uh, reading in front of the class remained both groups' least favourite reading activity. Um, but whereas the comparison group enjoyed it less than previously, um, considerably less, uh, the intervention group at least found it slightly more appealing. Um, the greatest variation in the intervention group's feelings about the activities listed within this, within this area of questioning was towards having conversations at home about reading. Enjoyment of this uh, rose by 21 percentage points uh, in the intervention group and by only 10 uh, percentage, by comparison, 10 percentage points in the comparison group. Parent surveys responses also significant an upward, uh, signified an upward trend revealing that the proportion of children in the intervention group who talked about reading every day or nearly every day rose by 22 percentage points compared to just three percentage points in the
I just shout. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, I'll move on to creativity, a slightly nebulous concept, but um, in both groups, the number of people who consider them to be, uh, themselves to be very or a bit creative rose, um, but this increase was far more pronounced in the intervention group uh, at 40 percentage points compared to 12 percentage points in the comparison group. Um, bringing specialist art teachers and professional illustrators into the classroom, perhaps not surprisingly, had a real influence on pupils' creative uh, processes and output. 70% uh, of pupils said that, that the way they came up with ideas had changed over the course of the intervention. And artists noticed students making connections between workshops, um, how they took direct inspiration from the Phoenix comic, uh, a growth in self-reflection about their work. Um, and um, I think in this slide, um, there's a nice little uh, quotation about comics encouraging risk, um, that, that there aren't any rules. And so this is uh, one way in which creative can, creativity can be enhanced by that form. Um, there was, again, transfer of comic skills to other parts of the curriculum, such as the use of space in the presentation of posters about the Anglo-Saxon history lessons. And the class teacher noted a sort of creative osmosis, uh, I think they called it, leading to a greater, greater confidence and greater productivity. Um, an improved sense of self was uh, indicated, a uh, newfound ability to read, um, without experiencing boredom, which is often note, noted in the uh, testimonies of the children. There was greater confidence in artistic stone, artistic styles, and expansion of their sort of imagination or creative power. Um, the most distinctive areas of change in terms of indicators in this area for the class that engaged with, with, with comics um, were both positive. In response to the statements, I do not have much to be proud of, disagreement increased by 25 percentage points, compared to 10 in the comparison group. And I am happy with myself, agreement rose by 29 percentage points compared to the comparison group. Um, I'm going to cut to uh, conclusions now. Um, sorry, didn't I not put that up? That's, uh, that's another quotation on the, on the well-being. So there were, um, Rowena conducted case studies on particular students to try and flesh out and surface some of the mechanisms. So uh, that she, she worked with... Um, one guy who, who was, who's had sort of behavioural, there were behavioural issues according to the teacher, and she looked into the way in which, which comics might have, might have impacted on improvement in, in his behaviour, which did, did in fact occur using these case studies. So that's just a, a bit of an indication of more, the more detail in the, in the reporting that came out. Um, okay, so as I say, cutting to conclusions. Um, in supporting uh, existing theory, uh, the research demonstrates that comics contributes to the acquisition of vocabulary and language skills, uh, invigorates reading habits, supports the development of creative processes, and evokes feelings of happiness, eagerness, and calm. Study-specific findings uh, also show that access to comics generates enjoyment of reading uh, more broadly, Shared experience of comic reading and, pro and production positively impacts social relationships in school and within families and helps to modify uh, negative behaviours, referring back to the example of Liam uh, there. Uh, comic book talk boosts um, confidence and self-esteem uh, self and comics workshops can generate mass appeal for drawing, stimulating creativity and self-expression through experimentation. So, um, some recommendations and further areas of further exploration. There are issues with resources. Schools need more resources to um, focus on comics and a more, a more diverse range of comics. University teacher training, uh, it's recommended, should incorporate academic study of comics and how they could be applied to the curriculum. There could be more signposting uh, uh, to comics collections. Um, uh, and age-appropriate comics by uh, publishers and literacy, uh, literary organisations who might also um, compile free comics resources centrally online. And then, of course, um, there's got to be more research, otherwise um, people in here would be out of work. So, um, the obvious, obvious questions to ask are, pos are the positive, ex uh, positive effects sustained? Um, 
More intriguingly, how do we explain contradictory findings, which I haven't, I haven't mentioned because I haven't had time to go into in detail. But there were, I mean, a, a, number, of, um, a number of indicators in which uh, both groups made progress, uh, despite only one having the comics intervention. And there were others where the comparison group, the group that didn't get the comics, made more progress than, apparently, than the intervention group. So an example of here is reading out of school doing the duration and, and, I think, quantity of reading out of school, in their responses to questionnaires, the kids in the comparison group claimed that they were doing much more than was claimed by the intervention group. Um, so, you know, how to explain that kind of thing? Well, in, there, is a, there is a potential exploration. I mean, this is a quasi-experiment. It's a, it's a complex social environment. There isn't really isolation when the bell goes. Um, so you've got this sort of cross-contamination that, that occurs if you if you do this kind of stuff. And actually, the, the class teacher uh, was very clear that there was some kind of comp competition going on between particular groups of kids. Um, and uh, he, he, he reckoned that the, the, the comparison group was, was, was probably kidding him on. And he thought that was reflected in the quality of their reading back in class. Now, that, I think, is something to, to, to be um, considered in further research, where you, you work with, with classes, both classes more, more carefully, more um, uh, in a comparative way. Um, so I think i better stop because we've got no time for questions. Uh, thanks to Rowena. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. I, I, I knew I'd forget that. So um, I think we have two members of Kigali here. Is that Kigali, um, are one of the um, artist groups that uh, provided very successful workshop, and they've just helped, um, just given us a little film to show you whilst we, we put the panel in place. So Kugali is a company focused on visual storytelling, specifically African visual storytelling, and we want to be the home of all African stories. So that's what Kugali is, and what we do is, we have a few fields we focus on. We started off in comic books and then evolved into augmented reality and now we're in animation as well. So that's what we do. The aims of the workshop today is trying to get the kids to engage more in reading by using comic books. Stories are how we understand the world and it's a very easy way for anybody to understand. That's the way we make sense of ourselves. So getting kids to use stories to learn how to do different things, it makes it a lot more exciting and a lot more of a human way of understanding things. We are very surprised because they think way more than we thought they knew. In terms of like, these kids know what paneling is in comics. Um, they noticed little bits of colour patterns and how one panel blends into the other. Um, so yeah, in that sense, they're very intriguing. The aspects of comics that pupils are looking at in today's workshop with Kugali are diversity and representation in comics, looking at a number of different comics that are created by Kugali that have completely different um, stylistic presentations. And then um, in the afternoon session we're going to look at partnerships between um, the writer and then the visual aspects and how the comic can be created by two different people with two different skill sets. So we're going to look at how they can take on those roles themselves in little pairs. One thing they should take away from today is how to build a story, basically. Um, we want them to go away from here knowing what they need to do in order to build a story from A to Z. The benefits of us bringing artists and writers and comic creators into the classroom are that they bring a real life element of comics that myself and Sim can't bring just as educators. So alongside the workshops that we lead that are led by effectively teachers, myself as a secondary school teacher and Sim as a primary school teacher, um, we don't bring that life of actually having worked in the industry. So by bringing comic illustrators or writers or both into the classroom, it gives the children an opportunity to see what there is out there in terms of the comics industry and seeing more role models um, and things to aspire to. Um, so in general, um, the children's sort of level of engagement with reading is noticeably higher than in other children of their age group, so compared to the other year four class, their level of engagement and enjoyment of reading and their wanting to read is really high. I've been teaching for a few years now and I've really noticed a difference in them. 
So pupils are engaging really well today. For the first time today, we're looking specifically at African comics and the content of African comics. And I think particularly with Lake of Tears, the subject material, um, as Fami described it, is biopic. So you're telling a story, but through real life experiences. And I think some of that subject material um, is really serious, but because it's told through a comic with comic elements, it helps to lighten it in an appropriate way, which makes the subject material digestible, which as a concept, if you were to talk about um, child slavery in the classroom, it would be really difficult to navigate that subject material, but by demonstrating it through a comic, it brings it to life in an age appropriate manner and the visuals alongside um, the written narrative help to tell that story in a way which they can comprehend, which you wouldn't be able to do if you were watching a video or if just a teacher was talking about it. We notice as a children, one, they are very engaged or paying attention the whole time. And if you know any kids around that age, it's very hard to get them to do that. That was the first thing I noticed. Second thing is their creativity was very unbound. We tend to put kids in a box where they think they should be like this or cute, whatever, but kids are kids. They imagine whatever they want and we want them to explore those. Obviously, we wanted them to be in a way that's very safe for them so they don't get absolutely crazy. So you just put a box, but you make the box as wide as possible to encourage all the kind of kids. Today's workshop has been a real privilege to be able to work with Kugali and to get members of the Kugali team into the classroom. I think it's been a real inspiration to work with a range of different artists and it is um, a real privilege to be part of this research project and actually to see firsthand how effective comics are in the classroom because it's gone beyond what any of our expectations were and obviously we you know we'd hope to prove that you know comics do improve reading for enjoyment do improve children's well-being but everything that we're seeing today and across all of our workshops really do um, back up that we've got the evidence to prove that spring to mind, you know, seeing all of your fantastic presentations. Um, first of all, you know, you very clearly demonstrated that comics can help with kind of literacy. Um, but something that seemed to be touched on by a couple of the presentations is that perhaps it also helps with kind of fitting into societies, that when people come from other countries and find themselves somewhat kind of like adrift in a new place that they've moved to, that actually learning that stories are somewhat universal and they can kind of compare their own experience with stories they see in comics. Do you think that that is also kind of having an effect on their kind of integrating in society? Anyone who wants to go for that? I mean, I, I could ask Andrew a question while the others are deliberating. Um, conversely, I mean, you know, with the research uh, that LeCaf is doing with these primary schools, it seems like the next obvious step is, you know, talk to government and say, look, we've proved that comics helps literacy. Can we get comics on the curriculum? Yeah, uh, I think that that is, um, I think that's part of the organisation's plans. Um, but yeah, I think what you could do is kind of work with state.
So, regarding the other question, who wants to go for the, the, the <laughs> idea of uh, social integration? Um, okay, I, I'll give it a try. Um, I think it's hard to speak from from our participants' point of view because they they don't really they're not really aware of everything that's around them of of, of all of the the culture and they don't feel as comics using comics as an essential step into getting closer to society. It just seems that they really enjoy reading and 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 get some interest and and. They really enjoy it. I think in, in our case, well, for our three, three projects, we worked with adults. I think as a kid would enjoy it, actually. And, and when I think back on learning how to read, it was always with drawing. And we, we draw and we, we wrote on the drawings. And, and, and we also read comics. And it's actually it's the same process using for, used for adults. And I think the one thing that is seen in our project is that adults can enjoy it in a literacy process as well. For, uh, that's my personal experience. Um, and I think there's a, a difference um, when you um, work with children and with adults. That's a very, very different thing because uh, children say, uh, are drawing naturally, uh, um, but adults lost this ability that uh, usually uh, um, people uh, stop drawing at 10, 11 years uh, because uh, school uh, not, um, school prefers uh, uh, writing and, and, and text because uh, school uh, knows uh, how uh, teach uh, to, 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 to write and, and to learn uh, uh, text but not uh, how to teach uh, drawing. Uh, so uh, when adults um, discover comics, and, and in this case uh, we, uh, we show uh, um, some examples of comics like uh, Marianne Satrapic uh, um, uh, and um, Carlos Jiménez Paracuellos who explained his autobiography, is the first I think uh, uh, who did it. And there's a, um, an ancient uh, um, comic art, a comic artist who uh, who um, uh, finished the streets is Michel Fouste, and who uh, draws uh, who draws his life. Uh, he's recently dead, I think. So uh, w when when these people with adult people uh, mm, uh, sees that comics can explain uh, uh, there's uh, more more important things than l real things. That's uh, that's a discovering for for them. And um, and they, they improve their capacity to to to, le to learn to read and and to and to and to draw too. <laughs> um, I suppose you know, LeCaf in general, you know, its kind of uh, mission statement is to bring comics, you know, to a wider audience. But in terms of the European perspective, as Brits, you know, we think of in um, France and Belgium, you know, comics just being completely integrated into society, that everyone loves it. But I get a feeling that you still all sort of struggled in a way to get comics accepted as a legitimate way of, you know, kind of contacting people and helping people and lifting them up. Does that seem a reasonable comment? Anyone want to respond to that? Yeah, I think the the idea that comics are very well integrated in society or or in 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 people's lives in in general in in France or Belgium, it's um, only partly tr it's only partly true. I think it's a bit of an elitist elitist um, reality, which isn't true for society as a whole at all. Actually, that's that's many many different realities and. So in, uh, in in Catalan, Catalonia, and in Spain, and all Spain, there's uh, there's not, uh, not not the same as Belgium or as French because uh, comics that are not uh, not intellectual um, um, level, just uh, entertainment level, 
so it's difficult to show people uh, that comics can uh, explain uh, serious things or uh, are good, good things because uh, uh, there are uh, just an, um, some invasion from American comics that is just American superhero comics and the stupid things like, like that. Like that and manga comics uh, as a lowest level, just the the, the most. Uh, um, uh, Fine things, stories, finding war stories, not uh, not the, the 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 good stories that that uh, that uh, that's in, in Japan and 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 in the USA. So it's it's a it's a difficult um, to to show that comics can 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 do anything else. Well, and hopefully this panel is demonstrated. Oh yes, you had a question. And it, sorry, is there a danger in mainstreaming comics and turning them into kind of like so, a sort of intervention or a treatment almost to get people to sort of fit government agendas um, as a sort of instrumentalist medium? And I really like the idea of comics as a form of resistance or as a form of critique of mainstream society. And if we mainstream them, then they can no longer operate like that so I guess my question is the broader one is is there a danger to using comics in this kind of way whilst I appreciate that it you know there's lots of good things about about doing that is there a danger that we're potentially losing something that's the essence of comics as being an alternative critical medium that's outside the mainstream what kind of, uh, what kind of danger are you think about what kind of danger you are thinking about? Danger, yeah. Okay, so that they lose their critical edge and they can... Because I think one of the things that comics can, be, can do is kind of be a medium for like activist groups to kind of challenge mainstream society. So it might be by, by refugee groups, by homelessness groups, as a way to critique, say, government policy. Whereas what I potentially see them being doing is used to fit government policy. So government agendas might be to, for social inclusion, for example. So we get everybody involved in mainstream society via comics. But an alternative use of comics might be to use them to, to resist that very idea of, being, of the society which we're being included in. Does that make sense? Maybe I'm an old-fashioned old 60s rebel. <laughs> uh, for us, th th this question is not so... Uh, we don't ask us this question because we are associations, so we don't have uh, um, public uh, funds, so we do what we want, clearly. Mm -hmm. So we use the comics we want, and we, we don't ask this question to ourselves. And uh, I'm not sure, but I, I'm not a comic specialist, but I, I don't have the feeling that uh, comics are seen as a danger in France. I, I'm not sure. I mean. Um, yeah. Um, maybe they should be. Yeah. <laughs> but if we can use some uh, comics to resist uh, in our classes, uh, we will do it. Yeah. I, I think it's a really great question. But would you ask that question about film, for example? Film can be Steven Spielberg and it can be Ken Loach. It's a medium, it can do everything. Cool. Um, I think we probably should wrap it up there. Um, we could probably shave five minutes off on the later panels <laughs> or, or both of the later panels. Um, so if everyone wants to take a 15-minute break, if you have any individual uh, questions of anyone on the panel, please uh, corner them. And if you speak French or Spanish, it'll make it a lot easier. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to thank everyone who has assembled on page.
Gentlemen, if I could get you to um, return to your seats. Okay, um, for our next panel, we have three comics researchers who are going to be talking about uh, areas of sequential art that they've currently been looking at. All on three very different topics, but I think you know when it comes to uh, the panel afterwards, perhaps we can tease out some connections. Um, and to start off with, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, our boreal flaneur, uh, Oliver East. <laughs> Um, so, uh, just a bit of context before I start. The work I am going to be presenting began in 2016. Uh, up until that point, I'd been making comics about walking and landscape for about 10 years. So, I'm close to tw tw 20 years of making comics about walking. I grew up down the road, so I'm from Manchester, if anyone knows Manchester, you can probably get the 142 outside of here to my birthplace. Um, I've made comics about uh, convoluted excursions with arbitrarily imposed restrictions, and then I tell you how badly they went. So I've walked from Manchester Oxford Road to Blackpool North train station, Manchester Piccadilly to Liverpool Lime Street. Uh, I've walked from Berlin to the Polish border, and if any of you have braved downstairs yet, there's a uh, skeleton of an elephant, which is a famous elephant that in 1872 walked from Edinburgh to Manchester. And as a commission, because I was the walking comics guy, I recreated that uh, walk uh, 220 miles in 10 days um, back in 2015. So this research starts uh, from a place where I'm the walking comics guy. Um, so, bit of context there. So, I was the walking comics guy, but I wasn't the teacher guy yet. Um, a friend and colleague uh, runs the educational program at the Whitworth Art Gallery, which is part of this university just next door. She asked me if I would be interested in doing some drawing workshops with children. She assumed I'd worked with children before. I let her think that because I needed <laughs> the money. I hadn't. My first teaching experience was with 36-year-olds all around me. Workshops were two hours. And for the first six months, I only had an hour and a half's worth of material in my locker. So for the last half an hour of every workshop, I had 30 children around me going, what now? And I don't know. Uh, so, that, so my research was born out of necessity and panic. Um, we would we we would do exercises in the work in the gallery, and then the children would look up at me and go, "What now?" So I said, "Well, I don't know. Let's um, uh, everyone in the park because the gallery is next to a park, and it would take five minutes to get in the, the park. So we would get into the park. What now?" Um, oh, oh, right, okay. Draw the park, but you're not allowed to stop walking. Brilliant, great idea. <laughs> so it was a restriction. I'd already introduced them to drawing restrictions. Walking was just a new one, and it killed half an hour. But I, I quickly got really good feedback from, from teachers of students with special educational needs that had struggled with previous drawing exercises, but given the freedom to walk about, they were high-fiving me on the way back onto the coach. So I knew there was something in it. Um, and so I started to explore it. I was already interested in um, chance and time as constraints around which to build my comics work. I'm really interested in creating scenarios where things can possibly go really badly and then I can tell you about those um, and so I, in 2018 I did, I did an MA around this walking and drawing at the same time method I came across this guy who said this thing 
which meant, oh, okay, so maybe I'm an architect now. And I like the sound of that, because architects are cool, and they make loads of money. So I started to explore walking as a creative act, um, as a form of architecture. So thanks to the sadly missed Aileen McAvoy and the Lightcast team, uh, for they carried on a pattern of crazy excited people who keep gi giving me big bags of money to do comic stuff for some reason and sent me to the Helsinki Comic Art Festival with some help from our Council England as well as part of a grant called the, it's not a grant anymore, but it was a grant for um, sending people ab uh, abroad for projects. So they don't do that grant anymore. Anyway, so I was a guest of the Helsinki Comic Festival for a week and a half. Um, and I devised, again, uh, a arbitrary line to follow, which might put me in a situation where things could go terribly wrong. Um, so I found, did the slightest bit of rudimentary research, and apparently Tampere uh, is known as the Manchester of the North in Finland, and that was all I needed. <laughs> as, as an excuse just to walk that way. So the route sticks as close to the train line as possible, so the, the decision of where I go is taken out of my hands, so it's, it, it's, uh, it absolves me of responsibility of where I might find myself. But also it, it prevents the temptation to walk my, if there's a safari park there, it's just like uh, an amusement park here, Absolves you of the responsibility of where you are, but also the uh, expectation to go anywhere interesting. Um, so the I'd been t I'd been teaching the walking and drawing as part of a workshop for a year by this point, and I hadn't actually tried it myself. So that took eight days. So I'd, I thought I'd better put. Uh, my research where my mouth is and do it myself so the only stipulations I put on myself were I couldn't stop drawing which prevented me waiting for anything interesting to draw so I wasn't waiting for a particular landscape or a particularly sexy tractor or something like that I just drew constantly but also I didn't stop moving either so I was I had a clipboard on me like this and I just walk constantly drawing and always from sight never from memory so again if I saw a particularly sexy tractor I'd only draw it whilst it was in my line of sight rather than adding further details once it had passed so giving over mark making and content decisions to um, constraints of chance and time and movement. So across the eight days, I produced about 800 of these drawings. Again, I've never done it before. I had, like, in the workshops, perhaps it might have been helpful if I had demonstrated it beforehand, but it had never occurred to me to do that. I just let the kids walk around. Um, so after eight days of the festival, sorry, eight days of the re residency, I had 800 of these A5 sketches. Um, and then what to do with the sketches. And I fannied about for ages, adding color, color different layers. I uh, was into airbrush stuff at the time, but then I remembered what <coughs> our Lord God and Saviour, John Paul Helena of King, Co King Cat Comics, said that black and white contain all of the colours. And so as an extra challenge, I wanted to uh, present the research in a format that was that didn't make any concessions to spectacle in any way. So I produced the book called um, uh, You Can't Draw the Same Tree Twice because after three days, the whole endeavour became how many times can you draw the same tree? because I don't know if you've been to Finland, but it's trees. <laughs> Outside of Helsinki, it's just 
wall to wall. It's the same tree for 220 miles. <laughs> and so it became a meditative uh, experience as well. But I presented it with... Um, uh, I fancy myself as a poet a little bit, unless there's any poets in the, the room, and then I'm a comic artist who writes poetry. <laughs> um, but each, each uh, the spreads in the book, uh, the chapters in the book reflect days of the walk, and the poetry is written with a meter in mind to reflect the footfall of that particular day. So if I was having a good day without blisters or getting lost then you know it might have a, a, a faster meter um, if I was having a bad day I might slow that meter down um, it was important that I present the data for want of a better I mean, it's not a great word for the drawings but I presented them in their raw um, state so, so, so they are as they were drawn on the road. Um, so if you read the book, you can see me getting to grips with the material and the technique as the, as the miles clock, clock, clock on. And I get better or <coughs> worse, depending on um, how you interpret that in particular. So at the start of it, I was still trying to work with tools that I'd use at home on my drawing Board, but I couldn't draw particularly well with a brush pen whilst moving like this. So I had to give up on favoured um, methods of working. So, mindful of time. So that was, you can't draw the same tree twice. And then, uh, skipping forward a bit, um, just to touch on something, when, as a walking artist, what what does a walking artist do in the middle of, of a pandemic when you have to stay in? Like I, I go on l long convoluted excur ex excursions. We were allowed out the house for an hour at a time, so I would use that hour to walk around the blocks in, in my neighbourhood where I live down in Old Trafford. So again, I would walk and draw at the same time. But whereas in, um, you can't draw the same tree twice, the drawings are presented in their raw state. In blocks, I experimented with just tightening those lines up as a way to um, try to present architecture as it's actually experienced, as in you're moving through and around it. Um, so that was my um, pandemic project that's a, another spread from so this makes me an architect now if I had longer than 15 minutes I could theorize that into convincing you about that but that's for maybe next um, ne next year and a peer re re review so another um, person who keeps giving me big bags of money to make weird comics is Annie Kaoma of Kaoma Provides in Toronto. Um, she, get, she gave me a thousand pounds to do with, with whatever I wanted to do. So I spent it on a flight and an Airbnb B &B to go to Toronto. And I thought, what can I do there that I can't do in Manchester? So I thought rather than, I'd already been to Toronto and tried to walk to Niagara Falls in Birkenstocks and failed miserably. So I thought, what can I do that's shorter, that, 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 that's the kind of opposite of that? So I decided, um, we don't have baseball that I'm aware of in Manchester. Uh, so I decided I'd walk around the circumference of baseball diamonds and I'd collect as many as I can in the week that I was there. Uh, I'd get through 40 at the time and I would use, I would, Again, sketch whilst I'm walking from uh, the home plate, the first base, the second base, the third, and home again. And that would dictate the uh, structure of the comic book page. And so the idea was that I would use things I'd seen, heard, experienced, 
whilst walking around this uh, structure to dictate the um, content of the comics, but also the structure as well. So because of the four um, lap nature of the diamond, that dictated a four tier approach to the comic book page. And each faithful diamond has this kind of stages, um, narrative laden uh, metal structure around it. So the first and the last legs were split into panels dictated by reed. Um, and so I, for a week, a week and a half, I walked around 40 or 50 faithful diamonds, drawing things I could see and hear. And, um, and I used those sketches and notes to riff off uh, works of fiction. So this is um, I was privy to a conversation uh, I was privy or spied on or um, uh, this I was often witness to local uh, park keepers tending to the ball park area that became um, a repeating narrative uh, so, th so, these, so these are the original sketches, this is the finished comic work, it takes on a story where this guy's a park keeper and he's got an Instagram where he shows off his, his favourite line work in the ball park and the two um, members of his audience are taking the mickey out of him. Uh, this is another one, this is another ball park called Cr 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 Crissy Pit, so these are the um, raw sketches from uh, the first plate, second plate, third plate, home plate, and it eventually became a narrative about how this young lady who I'd witnessed on a swing had crippling OCD, which meant she couldn't actually get off the swing. She dies in the end. Um, somewhere in between, her parents monetize her OCD. So the Walking and chance constraints are used as tactics to riff off new um, fiction works. And I think that might be... Oh, no, wait. So to, to come back around again, uh, just to end on, now I know what I'm doing with walking and drawing. Lycap kindly had me back uh, last year to uh, teach a, a, a workshop based on the, the research, not based on a hunch. Thank you very much. <laughs> er, there's something techy that needs to be done here. <laughs> um, well, uh, I guess, um, James, you can swap over the presentations. Um, oh, you, I, I, God, I am going to have to come up with some jokes now to fill the time. Um, so thank you, Oliver, that's fantastic research. Uh, and someone who's looking at architecture and comics, I'm happy to bestow the title of architect on you, if you like. Um, coming at the topic of uh, comics and interventions in different societies in a very different way, um, Dr. James Scorer is now going to talk about racism and anti-racism in Latin American countries. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much to everyone for the organization of this event and for inviting me to participate. Um, I am going to talk a bit about a project that I am the principal investigator for called Comics and Race in Latin America. Uh, it is a, a, a team project, um, so I'm partly sort of speaking on behalf of the other people who are involved in this particular project who are listed there. So some of the things that I'll talk about are actually things that they've um, discovered, researched, thought, so I'm sort of appropriating their ideas. Uh, in, in parts of that. Um, but it's a, it's a three-year project and um, it essentially has two elements to it. One is a historical element insofar as we're trying to look at different forms of racial representation in Latin American comics from the late 19th century right up to the present day. And that's looking at you know, newspapers, magazines, blogs, zines, anything else, we're pretty liberal in our understanding of what comics are. 
Um, and then at the same time, there's a sort of a contemporary dimension where we're working with a group of six artists um, from three different countries, Argentina, Peru, and Colombia, and sort of working with them in different shapes and forms to get them to produce some comics, but also to talk to us about creating comics and perhaps how race impacts their work in different shapes and forms in their respective contexts. Um, the project is funded by the AHRC, but we also have some collaborators. Um, I put three of them up there, but there are some more uh, universities as well um, that we're working alongside creating events and uh, sort of drawing on uh, their expertise in different shapes and forms. Um, and that is the, the project website um, and uh, it's worth exploring because there's some interesting zines in particular. I'd, I'd flag those up. Um, and these are zines that have been created as part of the project. Um, to a degree, sort of collaborations between academics and artists, although maybe I was a bit, um, uh, I don't know, pie in the sky about what that might actually mean in practice. Um, but there are certainly sort of elements of col collaboration in those, and there'll be more zines being added to that particular part of the website hopefully in the next month or so but I thought I'd focus mainly just on using some images to demonstrate different ways in which race has been taken up in Latin American comics uh, as we know comics have a sort of a, tr a fairly troubled relationship to race in different shapes and forms uh, across the the globe um, but we were sort of interested in tracing not just the kind of uh, the racism, if you like, but also maybe the anti-racist gestures that we could find alongside those kind of more racist elements. And also maybe to kind of nuance some of our perspectives on what we would quite simply designate as something that was racist. Like how was it racist or in what ways? Or could we find elements that maybe were trying to sort of approach things in a slightly different way at the same time? Um, you know, maybe differences in terms of narrative and image, for example, that we might find. So obviously these kinds of quite early images, this is sort of around 1900, um, you know, a kind of a, a classic depiction of a troubling relationship between technology and blackness. Um, these kinds of things are also clear to sort of, you know, Asian immigration to Latin America, and again, a sort of troubled relationship to technology, and obviously with the presence of the camera, the sort of the whole politics of sort of visualization, technology, and race mixed up in that. And sort of interesting that this idea recurs in, in uh, several different comics. So, um, you know, here the idea that uh, the, the kind of uh, indigenous populations are not really sure what the camera is and think that it's some kind of weapon, and then they end up attacking the, the photographer. Um, and here, uh, an example of um, a black man who wants to have his image taken, and when he sees the negative, he's really happy because he thinks he's been whitened, uh, but then the photographer shows him the sort of the, the positive image, and he realizes that, no, he, he's still black, right? So these kind of really troubling narratives around sort of politics of, of racial discourses. Um, there's a couple of pages from early comics from Argentina. Uh, this is sort of 1910, 1920. Um, and uh, again, sort of uh, ideas around sort of masking, dressing up, um, sort of uh, uh, various different ideas around this idea of what it means to be uh, black in different shapes and forms. But also quite interesting because it blackness is a presence in Argentine culture. Historically, the narrative is that Argentina is a sort of a white nation uh, and that sort of it doesn't have indigenous populations and it doesn't, certainly doesn't have Afro-Argentine populations. Well, these kind of comics prove that narrative to be um, demonstrably false. Uh, and in fact, um, some of these comics have slightly more nuanced narratives about blackness. I mean, they, they certainly could be classified as racist, but there are other elements of them which sort of are thinking about blackness and its impact on Argentine society in slightly more profound ways. But you still get things like this. This is from a 20s uh, kids magazine. In fact, I think most of the comics in this were um, syndicated publications that weren't, weren't um, actually, uh, uh, you didn't actually get the names of the contributors. Um, but I think they were just broadly translations stolen from North American comics. Um, but you know, here sort of images of this sort of cutout mask that you could put on and then sort of uh, tease the kids in your neighborhood. You know, you get images like this kind of thing in comics of this period. 
But then as you go into the kind of um, 30s and 40s, certainly in, in this case in Argentina, there's an interesting um, shift, if you like, towards more indigenous groups and indigenous populations in a more sustained way and a more kind of, uh, or at least as an effort to try and create a sense of historical veracity in the depiction of indigenous populations. So, you know, this is, comes from a kind of a work that was done by a very important Argentine um, artist in which he sort of compiles images related to uh, the life on the Pampas indigenous populations. Um, and certainly some of, the some of the narrative and some of the text is quite racist in terms of um, what it's trying to tell you about these populations. But there is this sense that in which you get these very specific details about um, kind of life in this particular part of Argentina, which is in fact in the past. Um, and that fits with definitely a sense in which artists are trying to sort of uh, group racial identity in different shapes and forms and get these kinds of images where you kind of sort of dis um, describe, document, and then sort of, I, I guess, disseminate certain racialized profiles or groups. Uh, and this last one comes from the Escuela Panamericana de Arte, the Pan American School of Art, which was based on Alex Raymond's work. Uh, and it was an idea that you would kind of subscribe to this and learn how to draw comics. There isn't an awful lot about race in it, but I, I did find this particular page where you sort of get a clear indication that you are supposed to draw, uh, you know, indigenous black people in this particular fashion. Um, this is just a couple of examples from Peru, sort of um, now heading more into the kind of uh, 60s in Peru, where you start seeing... Um, real presence of indigenous um, uh, populations and not least the figure of the Cholo who's this sort of like urbanized Indian migrant uh, and uh, this is a sort of a frequent trope in Peruvian culture as a way of sort of trying to think through national identity in relation to race uh, uh, in different shapes and forms. Uh, these are um, Interesting images that come from Argentina, sort of the, the so-called golden age of comics in Latin America, sort of 1950s, early 60s, um, when, you know, there was a big boom in production and, you know, it's a sort of a, a period when famously certain people were employed um, from abroad to come and work in Argentina, Hugo Pratt being the, the, the obvious example. Uh, these are stories, in this case, written by Hector Oesterheld, you know, Argentina's most famous uh, comic book uh, script writer um, and you know the idea is at least according to the uh, the critical bibliography that this is a period when Argentine comics starts moving away from the dichotomies of good and bad um, particularly trying to sort of nuance its uh, its relationship to indigeneity in particular um, and you know there are lots and lots and lots of comics about particularly uh, colonial and post-colonial U.S and 19th century Argentina. And these are the two periods that get picked up on a, a, a lot in this period uh, in terms of sort of representations of, of race in different shapes and forms. But then in the um, 60s, and, and I'd say particularly in the wake of the, the Cuban revolution and the kind of political shifts that take place in Latin America uh, in, in, the mid, uh, in the mid 20th century, there is definitely a sense that comics are taking up more of a kind of a, a directly political combative um, role. So there's a sort of an element of a comics of pedagogy around race. So comics is a kind of tool for <coughs> instructing the masses in different shapes and forms. And also comics as a form of protest, right? So protesting against racial injustices, class difference, uh, exploitation, <coughs> neo-imperialism, neo et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So race then becomes part of a wider um, ideological conflict that is playing out in the kind of 1960s and, and 1970s. And uh, a part of that, a big part of that is also a certain sort of historical revisionism, the sort of the history they taught us is false. We're going to use comics to teach you a different narrative about our past. Uh, and um, yeah, that, that happens across the continent, I would suggest. Um, and then that sort of um, documentary, historical kind of drive continues 
um, throughout this period, the 70s into the 80s as well, and uh, it, towards the end of this period, and then particularly into the 90s, it starts getting taken up as part of a, um, an exploration into historical memory. So particularly after the sort of civil conflicts that um, spread across Latin America in the 70s and 80s, in the wake of those, and in the wake of things like you know, torture and disappearance, you have a lot of comics that start exploring ideas of uh, historical memory in broad sense, but many of them in specific contexts is in relation to race and the, the racial past. Um, I, I chose this, these examples um, uh, because uh, these are examples that, come, that are created by Argentine um, comics creators in the sort of 80s and 90s. Um, so this is now kind of post, well, end of the dictatorships, heading into the kind of neoliberal era. Um, I think it's interesting that Argentine comics, if at the beginning of the 20th century were thinking about blackness as something that was present in Buenos Aires or Argentine culture, now blackness always seems to be somewhere else. Um, so these are comics that are set either in sort of New York or the US or uh, Brazil as well, okay? And there's several comics around slavery in Brazil, and then sort of famous examples here from Alex Sinner, Billie Holiday, um, you know, these, these kind of explorations of blackness, but displaced, if you like, into a, an, another context. Uh, so I think that's something interesting um, to, to reflect upon. But certainly in this period, which is not necessarily, a, I mean, it's a great, comics of great quality produced in this period, but it's not a period of great kind of comics industry in the way that it had been in the mid 20th century. It's a period of kind of crisis, if you like, in the comics industry. There's definitely a return to sort of fictional narratives about race. But then I would say more recently, particularly in the last 20 years, um, and here are some examples from Colombia, um, there's been an increased amount of state support for producing comics as part of debates around uh, neo-extractivism, historical memory, um, uh, different kinds of social issues in which race, race is embedded in, in different shapes and forms. So lots and lots of kind of documentary comics. Most of these can be found freely online um, that, are, that at least have some kind of racial element to them or an anti-racist, or, or some, some sense that comics might be an anti-racist weapon in the contemporary um, cultural sphere. Uh, these are some images that, that come from a zine or a couple of zines that, that were created as part of uh, the, the research projects. Um, we, we met in, in Lima a few months ago and um, did some sort of workshops and events with artists and created some of these kinds of uh, images. Because I, I wanted to sort of um, emphasize the fact that even though there is this, I would suggest, a sort of an increasing anti-racist comics discourse, if you like, in Latin America, most comics are still being produced by white mestizo creators, right? And, you know, historically it ever was thus, right, in Latin America. Um, so that's a, a, a dynamic that we're trying to sort of uh, engage with in different shapes and forms, and um, we have tried at least to put together a team of artists who identify in different ways, different racial ways, or have different racial heritages, uh, and sort of think about whether that makes a difference to the way that they talk about race, think about race, draw about race, or create comics about race. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's fairly obvious that they're going to have different styles, but whether embedded in that there is this sort of similar racial discourse or whether they have different approaches. Um, so, as I say, you can, you can go and have a look at some of that work online. Uh, there are translations um, for the, the zines, uh, though I can't remember whether I've uploaded them or not. I haven't uploaded them. Okay, I've got to do that. Um, so that, that's fine. Okay, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Um, and third in our panel of comics researchers talking about different aspects of comics around the world, Dr. Harriet Earle will be looking at comics and social change. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> um, thank you. Um, okay, let me see. Just pass one. Perfect. So, when I was given this topic, I thought, ha, ha. And I, 
<laughs> which I, I'm sure is everyone's response to, to such things. Um, but I thought, actually, what would be the easiest thing to do is to think about a specific case study of a comic that I think is doing interesting things with big stories that can uh, provoke social change. Um, before I begin to get into that, just to introduce myself, um, I'm Hattie. I, uh, I write about war comics, trauma, violence, serial killers, um, murder, you know, all the good stuff. Um, I've got a book coming out about Vietnam soon, so anyone who's interested in that, there you go. Um, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain um, what I mean by social change in relation to comics. I'm then going to give a very quick case study, Persepolis, in five minutes or fewer, um, and then answer the question of so what. Why am I saying this? Why should you care? Why is any of this interesting? And I wanted to stay away when thinking about social change from some of the really obvious uh, examples that people talk about, because they are all largely negative. Um, you can think of a couple of examples of comics really affecting uh, society on a, on a very visceral level recently, um, which is referenced in the Joe Sacco um, short strip up there. Um, these are examples, I would say, of political cartooning. Um, let's not debate whether those are comics. They, they are. Um, Hannah Berry, uh, with a Brexit, cutting off us and them, and then arguably the first uh, political cartoon ever, the Join or Die snake that's been all chopped up by Benjamin Franklin. Um, so comics doing things for social change, saying things about society, is, is by no means new. We have been doing it for um, several hundred years at least, as um, shown by the, the Hogarth that I had on the first, one of the, the early um, single panel comics, shall we go with that, to talk about social change. Um, but what I'm more interested in is the long form stuff. And these three came to mind particularly. Um, Zara's Paradise, which you, you may have uh, followed when it was a web comic, uh, telling in real time the story of what was going on in Baghdad, um, written by two, written and drawn by two artists who um, I believe to this day remain anonymous for their own safety. Now available in a book because, of course, a webcomic is not a real comic, but a book comic is. Um, the Ragged Trousers Philanthropists of a much loved novel, a largely impenetrable novel, if you've tried it that the Rickard sisters have drawn as, um, as a fantastic uh, sort of comic adaptation. Um, and, and what they've done with that is taken uh, a story that spoke very much to that very particular political and social milieu and made it relevant to the 21st century by changing absolutely nothing. It is horrifying how many of the panels of overweight landlords and landowners and politicians you can just post straight to twitter as a comment on the day it's just <laughs> horrifying and glorious at the same time um, and finally threads from the migrant crisis which is by kate evans um, who she went to uh, the jungle in calais uh, as a volunteer with her husband who i believe is an engineer and um, she said, I'm an artist, what can I do? Realising that she was probably quite useless as an artist in a refugee camp. Um, so she drew people and she gave, uh, especially the children of the camp, drawings of themselves. And then wrote about the experience through this lovely framework about lace, which is um, made in Calais as well. So they're all um, longer form comics, graphic novels if you want. Um, that deal in some way with social change and that are using all of the things that we love about the form, all of the ways into those really difficult, meaty topics uh, to talk about major issues that we may um, often shy away from. Which brings us to Persepolis, which I'm hoping that you are all a little bit familiar with. Um, so Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi. I've just lumped the whole thing in together. I know it's two parts, but let's just lump it in together. An autobiographical uh, graphic novel that focuses largely on the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Um, I will freely admit, going into this comic, I knew absolutely nothing about that part of the world or that history. Uh, I grew up in <coughs> Central Europe. I didn't have any understanding of what 
that was. So this was my introduction. And I think this is probably not an unusual position to be in for a lot of people. Um, originally published in French, she wrote it in, and drew it in France. It is uh, one of the top 10 most challenged books. What a, what a badge of honor, that's great. Um, and I had a look to see if it was still banned. Oh, hell yeah. It's banned all over, especially in the US. All of the South, it's banned, which I think is a great badge of honor for Satrapi. It shows that she's, uh, she's made something really quite fantastic if it's going to be banned to that level. And when reading through this comic, it's very simple. We've already seen some of the art. Um, Professor Peters showed us some of the, um, the very simple black and white artwork. But what I wanted to get to is why she chose to tell it in the comics form. She could have written a novel or a uh, memoir, but from an interview, I'm going to read it off now. I've actually tried, you know, at one time to write. If I had to write this short article or something, here I'm good. But for a novel, just forget about it. I lose all my sense of humour, I completely lose all my decency, and I become completely lousy and pathetic. Drawing gives to me the possibility of this sense of saying what I want to say. Comics is the only media in the world that you can use the image plus the writing plus the imagination and plus be active while reading it. I don't think I could have said it better myself. Um, and certainly I, I understand what she means about writing because it's, it's so difficult. But that drawing plus the imagination plus be active. So bringing the reader into the story. And that's really the thing I want to, uh, to emphasize here. Comics and social change are about bringing the reader into the story. I really have no interest in the story of the, um, the Iranian, uh, the Islamic revolution, because it isn't my story. I shouldn't say I have no interest, that was poorly worded. But it's not my story, I, am, I have no horse in this race. So bringing me into it, through the medium of comics is what's important. I apologize, I cut this page in half. I'm used to smaller presentation screens. This is one page. This is the very first page of the comic. You might, you might recognize it. And we start off with Margie, there she is on the very far left, in her veil. The children, the girls, have just been told that they have to be veiled and um, they, she's sitting next to her friends who are all equally veiled, looking miserable. Immediately underneath that, the, uh, the re revolution happens with this lovely, iconic gesture of the hands, the fists. Are they for the revolution or are they against it? We don't know. That's for us to think about. And the school saying, wear this. No explanation, wear this. So where is the reader in that? Well, the reader is with Margie. Someone is handing her the veil and saying, wear this, without explanation. And we're with her, so we have that confusion with her. We're being given this garment that she doesn't want, she doesn't understand, and the reader is right there. Maybe we're peering over the, uh, the wall there, looking at this happening and thinking, what is going on? And then, of course, the children are being children, they're pretending to be a horse, she's skipping with it, someone's being strangled, um, all normal playground stuff, I assume. And it clearly says in the caption, we didn't really like to wear the veil, especially since we didn't understand why we had to. So in this page, we are one page into this comic, we are thrown into it, we as the reader are with the children, we've got our veils on and we're thinking, what? So we're there, we're there with them. Simplicity of the faces, so we can put ourselves into these children. Now, I'm speaking for myself as a cis woman, that I can imagine myself as a small child. Um, your experience may be different, but this is how I believe that we're going to be reading this. So, for getting into this story of social change, what is more effective than quite literally asking you to be in the story with the protagonist?
So that's my very, very short case study. And if you haven't read Persepolis, I really do recommend that you, you do. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful comic. And I believe also now a film, um, an animated. My so what? Hopefully none of this will be news to you, but a reminder is always useful. So comics is tackling big themes, big themes like revolution, like genocide, like refugee migrant crises, um, small themes like um, individual health struggles or um, walking from Helsinki to Tampere in ways that are different from and complementary to other literary forms. Comics is not a genre of literature. I'm in an English department, and the next time someone says yeah. that to me, I will punch them. <laughs> <laughs> no jury would convict. But they speak to people of all ages across language and literacy barriers. As we've heard with the projects from Comic Art Europe, um, they are speaking to people across all kinds of language and literacy barriers. And um, cultural barriers too. Again, I'm, I'm not a, an Iranian woman, but I feel like I understand more of the story of something like Persepolis from reading the comic. And they can render complex ideas in a clear format, like we were shown in the um, Kugali video. Uh, child slavery for, how old were those children? Eight? But in comics, it's possible. And they're using their ignominious past to create nuanced narratives. Uh, one of my favorite quotations from The Simpsons is when Bart says, cartoons aren't sensible, they're just a bunch of funny stuff. And I believe that's in an episode about evolution and the evolution creationism debate. <laughs> Perfect quotation. So yes, you can shovel that heavy, complex, nuanced, messy stuff in there because no one is expecting it. Ha ha ha. So they just sneak it in there. Um, they can and they do change the world. Sometimes this is not for the good, but I would hope that um, it will become a positive force for change. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hattie. Um, if I could invite James and Oliver to, I thought this one's died, uh, to join us on stage to have a quick Q&A. Um, so I guess we can shave five minutes off the next panel or have the entire day run five minutes late. No, okay. Um, one thing that kind of struck me about all of the projects that three of you were talking about was actually they show that comics can give you insight into a part of the world that you just wouldn't know otherwise. So Hattie, you were talking about learning about uh, the Iranian revolution by reading uh, Persepolis. Oliver, you were obviously getting insight into parts of the world that you wouldn't otherwise known if you didn't actually walk it and document it. And then James, in terms of those kind of Latin American comics, again, you were probably discovering uh, parts about that part of the world that you wouldn't otherwise know. So I guess in terms of comics also being a way of kind of scrutinizing the world, I mean, certainly on a personal level, you know, when I've read uh, some of Joe Sacco's graphic novels, I've found out parts of history, parts of the world that I wouldn't otherwise know about. So I guess could you all kind of comment on the way that comics actually are a fantastic tool for kind of aiding um, understanding of just kind of areas uh, of geography, of society, um, and so on, that otherwise people might not be able to understand in other ways. Who wants to go for that? Hello. Oh, um, yep. yep, hello. Um, well, for me, um, when you read my work, you're, you're reading the work of, of uh, someone with dyslexia, uh, ADHD, um, someone who uh, doesn't learn well in traditional scenarios. So I invented these convoluted, um, what I've since discovered, uh, uh, um, epistemological 
if I may be so bold, experiences. Um, I, 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 I don't learn in a classroom. So um, I started to teach myself in the landscape. So I, I, I invent these um, experiences so I can learn something. That's where it all started from so um, I learn about architecture, landscape, geography by experiencing. So when you read the, uh, hopefully when you read the works of mine, you're experiencing that um, uh, interaction with an environment in a, in a more dynamic way perhaps than uh, through um, regular research, whatever that might be. Sorry if that didn't answer your question at all. But no, I think... Um, yeah, yeah uh, comics, for me, is about the process of making them more than the book that uh, you've not bought yet. Mm. So, uh, I'm, it, for me, it's a process. So, it's the process of... Collecting imagery from a walk or what have you, and then arranging it in what to me is a co coherent manner, using those drawings to um, riff off poetically. It's about making sense of my environment despite um, my cognitive kind of hurdles I have to go over, you know? Mm. Sorry if that didn't answer your question. No, I think it did. I, I think there's always been a sense that comics is interested in storytelling from below or from, I don't want to say the gutter, although I love the pun. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, like going right the way back to the yellow kid, he's a street child. And the Hogarth is, it's gin lane, there's also beer. Is it beer street or beer lane? Where they're, yeah. they're equally yeah. drunk and half naked. But, but not that, quite as much. The beer drinkers much. are shown to be more civilised than the gin drinkers. <laughs> <laughs> not my experience. But uh, <laughs> that, that idea that actually what comics has always been interested in is the, the, the people on the ground. And certainly um, looking at the, the English lit syllabus, um, teaching in an English department, we don't necessarily do enough of that actually listening to the individual stories of people who are workaday folk. And so I think quite a lot of what they've always been doing is that angle of history that we don't necessarily have any artistic interest in because it's quotidian, it's boring, it's, it's <coughs> banal, and yet it's what makes up everything that we do and exist within. Does that make any sense? Mm. I, th I think in my case, first of all, I, di I didn't go to Latin America through comics. I came to comics from Latin America, if you like, as a, or as a Latin Americanist. Mm. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd read comics as a kid for various, in, with various, in, in various different ways. But I, then I didn't for a long time, but, and then got back into it in, as a Latin Americanist, looking at Latin American production. So it was a slightly different way round. Um, and that also makes me think, in response to your question, that, that maybe there are also potentially at least sort of troubling elements of voyeurism mm. in any kind of study of comics from one part of the world to another, and particularly with all the kind of like imbalances that are implied in that, and in, in, in our case, or in my case, in any case, you know, a, a white man working at a, a privileged university studying, you know, black representations in Latin American comics. I mean, there is a power imbalance there that, that is potentially troubling, right? So I think you can learn an awful lot from uh, comics about different parts of the world, but I also think that potentially there are, yeah, troubling elements of voyeurism in, in that experience that one should always be conscious of. Um, and I... In fact, one of the earliest things, the first thing I wrote about comics was actually about Tintin's adventures in, in <laughs> South America. And one of the things that I kind of realized in that is you don't read those comics to learn about South America. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you read those comics to learn about what people think about South America. But as a, a Latin Americanist, um, did you find that the comics were doing something uh, that 
portrayed Latin America differently than other media? Um, <coughs> potentially. I mean, I'm always slightly suspicious of the idea that comics can do things that other mediums can't, and probably that's a very unpopular statement mm -hmm. here, but anyway. Um, but nonetheless, I think uh, it can do things in certain ways that can make you reflect about things in different ways, for sure. Um, and to give you an example, you know, I had already studied neoliberalism in, in Argentina and sort of Argentine culture in the 90s and 2000s through looking at representations of Buenos Aires in novels, film, art. Um, but I didn't look at the time at sort of zine production, which is something I did more recently. And that I found a sort of fascinating eye-opener into what it meant to be creating culture in that period when, you know, you had all the pressures of kind of like wealth inequality, difficulty of access to publishing houses, the no internet in which you could sort of disseminate this kind of material. So, you know, but at the same time, an incredibly rich period for zine production because mm. it was one way of accessing means of production through photocopiers or whatever else. So, yeah, I learned something about how people sort of uh, created culture in that period through you know, underground. comic zines and other kinds of zines as well. Yeah, which I think responds to that lady's question earlier about it being a kind of like edgy, underground, marginalised. Um, while we have uh, these three uh, researchers together, does anyone in the audience have any questions uh, for Hattie, uh, Oliver or James? Say now or forever wait until you find them on social media. <laughs> Sorry, when you're looking... Ooh. When you're looking at comics in Argentina, did you find a qualitative difference in the period of the Junta? You mean in terms of sort of the production of yeah, comics of in that the topics covered and the kinds of places you would find them? Um, so I haven't I haven't sort of extensively looked in that period in part because there wasn't a lot of the comics produced in that period were produced in exile. Um, so a lot, there was a lot of sort of cultural repression during that period. There was an important comics magazine called Super Humor, which did produce satirical uh, comics, um, but that's not something I've sort of read extensively, I have to say. Um, so I can't really say whether there's a difference in terms of racial representation during that period. Um, but, you know, for example, Alex Inner, you know, in which there is kind of a lot of representation of race and looks at sort of black communities in New York. I mean, that, a lot of that was produced in exile. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? No? Okay. Um, well, uh, Hattie, Oliver, and James, thank you very much for coming and presenting your work. So our final panel, um, if I could invite uh, Dave, um, Andrew and Benoit back to the stage uh, so we can have a little bit of a plenary, as a $5 term, uh, to talk about today's event. Um, well, maybe, Andrew, I could ask you to go first. I mean, in terms of this being kind of uh, a LeCaf event and being a place where uh, comic creators and um, academics are mixing, do you see kind of like, you know, a rich seam um, evolving in terms of kind of research and practice? Hmm. Yeah, so I, could, I can try and answer that on the research side as I, I just the disclaimer, disclaimer is I have no real expertise in comics. I mean, it's been... Some interesting, um, some very interesting things which we haven't had time to pick up on. I mean, there's clearly the very technical um, um, side to bringing people into or through literacy using comics, which I thought was very interesting, and um, I think they play a particular role with with children, and young people, which which the LICAF research um, refers to. I think what I think I'm still perplexed by. Um, claims about the arts of various kinds being, and this is James referred to this as being a bit of a cynic about this, and I share his 
some of his, well, I assume his reservations about it, these things doing something, other things can't. And I, I think we probably need a bit more research on that because I'm still open. I'm open to it. I've been involved with many different arts interventions. I mentioned the one about, you know, dancers and young offenders, and I've done stuff in prisons with theatre companies and so on. And I can see the chain. You know, I can, you can see what's happening, or you can see something happening. Um, but just isolating, isolating the effect of an art form like comics is quite hard to do. And I, don't, and I think artists often don't make it easy to find out what's going on either, because there is this sort of um, you know, faith in the mystery of process, artistic process, which they find. Sometimes I think they don't want to unpack because they like to um, you know, keep the mystery to themselves. But I, you know, as a, I, I do think it's possible to get at some of these things. And then we would need to work. Researchers would need to work with artists about that, you know. And we would need a, you know, we'd need kind of a cards on the table um, arrangement so that we weren't we weren't fencing around uh, what the issues were. Um, so I see there's a there's there is a um, there's a potentially productive relationship to be had. There was. I was drawn to what Jordi said to me, and he was up on the slide actually, um, when I met him in Barcelona. Um, he's, a, he's kind of old school when it comes to comes to the arts, and you know there is this you know, sort of self-evident, um, and the same with comics, and particularly the kinds of comics he prefers. Um, and I, I just, he talked about the need for an artist, an artistic or an artist language in research. Which I find a sort of fascinating, you know, proposal really. That how do we, how do we come to terms with artists are trying to get across by using a different type of language, which can then, um, then relate to everyday research concerns of academics. Which, as as, as one of the commentators um, and one of the questioners. Refer, it, it, it is sort of prosaic and instrumental and so on and so forth at one level. So what is a more creative way of talking about creative impact? And, and then how can it hold water? How can it contain weight? How can it be robust? So I, and I think there's, there's quite a bit of potential for that. I mean, it's an, it's an intriguing proposition. And just to sort of do the sales pitch, in my school, School of Social Sciences, and in John's school, um, and the Creative Manchester platform can sort of creating bridges across uh, different types of work and different types of research. There's a lot of good work going on on so-called creative methods. Um, so I think there's lots of potential there. I, mean, I don't know if anyone was sketch noting today, but I've read comics which show conference proceedings you know, <laughs> as a kind of an artistic expression, so it's an ideal medium for that. Um, between the two of you, uh, Benoit and Dave, you kind of rather nicely had a kind of uh, a talk about the history of comics and then, albeit from your point of view of practice, uh, a look at the present and possible future of comics. And it's really interesting where you see these kind of like themes come and go. I mean, the um, uh, example you showed from Toffler, um, Benoit, where he does amazing things like that uh, page set in a wine cellar and the panels get thinner and thinner and thinner like weird little slices of space time. You wouldn't see that in comics again for like another 150 years before people like Grant Morrison start doing it. You know, so do you see these kind of resonances between different time periods that people use comics in an experimental way and then that sort of aspect of it is lost and then it comes back again? For a very long time, I think it's for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for a very long time, there was no real history of comics. It was forgotten because of the press. Uh, and now we have the possibility to digitize a lot of old newspapers, very fragile, and to rediscover things. And I see a lot of connections between very early comics and very contemporary comics. Right. And we see also authors uh, like Art Spiegelman or Chris Ware or many, many uh, Alison Bechdel. And so they are interested in early comics and reinventing this history. It's not only an academic curiosity, it's also something really alive and unnecessary. For example, the silent comics. Um, two, three reflections uh, related to what we have heard during this very interesting day. Um, one, to continue some of your ideas, um, I really believe in the specificity 
of the language of, of comics, I don't believe in some purity of comics. So comics are, in a way, or graphic novels, uh, in a way, a mix of the illustration tradition, of a literary tradition. They are connected to animated movies. They are connected to, to feature movies and to many, many aspects, and, of course, painting also. But they have a specificity. And this specificity we need to understand, because if we want, for example, to teach comics, to use them uh, at school or in university, we need to understand that it's not just an example, but that we have to consider them as a specific form. For example, uh, for history lessons, we can use Josako or we can use Tardy about First World War, but we have to consider it as a specific narrative form, not just as a beautiful image. This is very important. Uh, second idea is um, very simple, but I think very important. Reading comics is reading. Reading comics is plainly and really reading. It's not a subculture. And it's reading plus something, mm. which is to learn to read images and to read the connections between words and image. This is Topher explains it perfectly, but I think it's very important because for many, many people, they think, yes, okay, okay, one day they will read a real book. Yeah. Uh, and it's a step. No, it's not a step. It's all reading. When I was a child, I read a lot of comics and a lot of books and then a lot of essays, and I continued to read comics. It was not, now you are a big boy and you can read novels. Uh, you can continue for your whole life, and certainly a book uh, like, uh, let's say, Jimmy Corgan, uh, or mm, Fun Home, or many other, th or mm, uh, my favorite things is Buster. It's a difficult reading. Comics are not always easy. This, this is also very important to say. It's not sad. And mm, even with manga, because some people say, oh, yes, graphic novels, this is great, but manga, subculture. No, you have a lot of mangas which are really sophisticated, fascinating, even if the graphic style looks, uh, in a way, more simple. And the uh, last point, a very mysterious one, is the connection between childhood and comics. I believe that there is really something. And when I heard some of the experiences, I, I, I understood that for an adult, which was never in contact with comics during his childhood, or with books, comics are difficult. Mm. Because those connections, for example, I was very interested by this example, the idea that the speech balloon is the voice of a character, and the discussion with different speech balloons it's a way to communicate. It's, it's not direct. And I've met very often some persons, especially women, who, who never read comics during their childhood. Maybe the parents said, or school said, oh, it's not good. Uh, and they say, oh, um, how should I read them? Uh, first the text, or first the image, or what is the order? And very cultivated persons. Uh, intelligent persons, but they don't know uh, how to do. So I think there is some connection happening during early childhood, which makes it obvious in a way. You will never see a six, seven, eight year uh, child asking, should I first read the balloon or look at the image? Something is happening. And there is so, even if comics are now adult in a way, and we say, oh yes, adult and part of the culture, I think that one part of comics is still deeply connected to our childhood. And this should be very interesting to, to uh, as an object for research, uh, to, to, to see this connection. What happens? Why is it so uh, easy mm. to enter in comics as a child 
And why can it be so difficult when you were not in contact with this form? Of course, we don't read the same comics as adults, um, even if we can still like, like I do, uh, Tintin or others. But um, we read them differently, but we have this uh, inside memory and, and w we feel at home yeah. with the genre of comics. And, and this is, I think, very important, and we don't have to forget this d dimension. Well, I mean, and I'm going to ask Dave a question in a second, but I think maybe it's something that people unlearn. I think there comes a point in your school curriculum where you get told to no longer draw and write at the same time, that the two disciplines get separated out, and then it becomes something you no longer do. You know, when there was obviously a period where those things went hand in hand. If you look at kind of scientific books from the 19th century with beautiful illustrations of flora and fauna, you know, it became, it, it, back then it was still acceptable for scientists to be artists. And then you learn in school in the 20th and 21st century that you don't draw anymore except in art classes after the age of nine or 10 or whatever. I think that's when the damage is done and you have to relearn it. Yes, this is something very deep. It was said earlier. Yeah. At a certain stage, we lose the spontaneous drawing. We want to draw correctly, mm. and then most of the people stop. And probably reading comics uh, oh. keep us in deep relation with the drawing child, mm. uh, probably, probably. But there is something. And, and Maybe we could do something different with, with learning of drawing or the learning of music. Children, they can mm. dance and sing, and even if it's bad, but they don't have this type of idea of good or bad. And suddenly, let's say, between primary school and secondary school, there is yeah. a wall. There is a wall, there is a judgment. And, and then you say, don't sing, don't draw, and just try to write properly and read properly, read real books. It's, it's strange. Well, although <laughs> although it, it seems that that um, formalization of what is right to read, what is the correct thing to read and write, is occurring earlier. Because what appealed to the kids in the, um, in the Abraham Moss school was the lack of rules. In you know one of the one of the things that was appealing was that they didn't have to follow the norm that they could be essentially doing what you're saying, which is just drawing from wherever it comes from. So maybe maybe this is not between primary school and secondary school, but much earlier now that the, the distinction is is drawing. Well, I mean, in a way that kind of leads me uh, onto your work, Dave. That it felt that when you were making comics throughout your career in comics, in fact, you know, you have brought in types of rendering on the page <coughs> that were atypical for the medium, whether it was collage, whether it was uh, a mixture of kind of uh, photography and drawing, whether it's uh, moving between different media on the same page between drawing and painting. Um, as if, I don't know if consciously or unconsciously, you felt there are two comics a little bit too staid and I want to do other things, you know, in terms of personal expression, in terms of just enjoying the tools that I'm using. Yeah, Big question. A lot to think about today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm not really sure where to go, really. Um, it's such a huge subject. Uh, You've got five minutes. Uh, five minutes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also sort of uncomfortable with the, I the idea that's been touched on a little bit, that comics are special in some way. I think they're an extraordinary medium. Clearly, they're my first love. Uh, they got me reading. Um, but they have their own qualities, no better, but crucially no worse, um, than any other medium. And they work for some people really well and not for others. And uh, for some people, going outside and doing things outside would be much better than being in a classroom reading comics. Um, so that's one. Um, I'm not interested in the mystery of art at all. Uh, I think that's mostly bunkum. Uh, and I think there's been lots of great... Uh, research about uh, what's happening in the brain when you when an idea comes and what inspiration is and what the creative act is uh, and I think that's all fascinating I'm really not happy with the decompartmentalization of our education uh, basically um, 
I don't like, uh, I actually don't like comics being taught. I think I'm just going to make me, <laughs> make people angry with me. Um, but I don't like this sort of little box that uh, they become part of. I think um, everything is connected. And I usually uh, am talking in art schools uh, to a group of people and they're illustration students or design students or whatever. Um, but, the, you know, they're isolated, and there's a whole campus out there. Go and talk to the scientists. They're great. Go and talk to historians and everybody else out there. Science needs art. Science needs that kind of out-of-box inspirational thinking. And art needs science. It needs a, a, a knowledge and recognition of the real world. And it's a great conversation to have. They should not be separated. And all of these little um, boxes of activity these walls should not exist. They should be, uh, there should be a freedom of information crossing. Unfortunately, from my own experience, I think it's getting worse rather than better, that universities used to be more collegiate, that different departments would talk to each other, but now actually walls come down between different departments because they protect their own budget and never talk to each other. I realise. I mean, I mean, that's why I'm saying it, really. I just yeah, yeah. think it's a really in, you know, embedded problem uh, that needs unpicking. Yeah. In terms of... Um, the question that you asked, uh, that's been, that was at the centre of my uh, thinking, really. I loved it all. Mm -hmm. I went to art school as a very blinkered, uh, I like my comics, I just leave me alone, I just want to draw that, uh, just let me get on with that. And I had a year fighting my tutors who just wanted me to look up, you know, <laughs> they just wanted me to open my eyes. And finally they won, thank God. <laughs> Um, and I looked up, and there's a world of creativity out there, and I just became a sponge. And so I put the comics to one side for a while. I did, still uh, drew the odd thing, but I tried everything else because at the end of four years, I came back to making comics, and they were that, I hope, they were that much richer for it. Um, the definition of comics is not that they're drawn or that they've got word balloons, as, been, as has been said. They are, it's as open as... It's a, it's a narrative of some kind. Um, and that's, a, you know, told in imagery. And that's about it. That can include photography and anything else. So I'm in favour of as broad a definition as, as possible of this powerful medium um, and breaking down those walls, really. Nice. Um, well, Andrew, I know you've got to run, but if anyone in the audience uh, has any questions uh, for either Benoit or Dave, perhaps addressing the overall themes of the day, um, now's your chance. Anybody? Be brave. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, it's just been a really great to hear um, so many different perspectives today. And my question, though, is about language. It, because it's been so interesting to hear about Spain and Belgium and France and about how comics work so differently in different cultures. And I suppose, Benoit, on your talk um, as well. And Dave, I know I've looked at some of the different covers of your work in Italy as opposed to the UK and things like that. And I wondered if you could just talk about comics in different visual cultures and about, about your sense of that um, from, from both of your, your, your experience as a practitioner and Benoit, your sense of um, about about different styles and different cultures, because it isn't a universal form. It was very interesting to hear about the African um, kind of comics uh, being worked with in, in the group in Abraham Moss as well. So that's my, my question. It's about language and visual language as well as actual language. Again, small question to answer in five yeah. minutes. <laughs> the whole world. There are certainly a question of language and the question of different cultural arrays. Uh, we can say that there is the uh, North American uh, with, with part of the British artist included in it because it's, it's a general market, it's very, very important and it has large audience, it's an industry since more than one century and many creators can work for it and it became more and more sophisticated and more and more popular in a way. There was a French, Belgian, Swiss uh, 
world of comics, which is very, very important. We spoke a few minutes ago about artists like Munoz, Munoz and Sampaio, uh, Hugo Pratt, some Spanish artists, some many countries in Europe, they published for the French market and they were paid by the French market. This is very important because even if, if they worked in their own language, they had this cultural area which was very, very important and creative and possible as, as a profession. It, it's becoming a little more difficult now for young creators, but it's still very important. And of course we have the third uh, huge market and huge traditional world of comics, which is the Japanese one, which is incredible, which is maybe the first, first one, the country where everybody is in connection with mangas, everybody, and you have all types of manga. We, we, we don't have all this variety in the translations. We think that it's more for teenagers, but in Japan you see that it's for everybody. And then, we have a lot of creativity uh, in Argentina, uh, in uh, Australia, in uh, many, many countries in Europe and everywhere, in Africa also. But there, it's very difficult to make a living with it. And then, uh, there you have to find a way to publish and to be read, maybe through internet, I don't know. Uh, but for the moment, uh, when you are an artist in Brazil, you want to work for America, for, 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 for the US. Uh, when you are a Russian artist, if you are an Ukrainian artist, you want to, to work maybe for the American market of, or the French market, because uh, it's, it's very difficult. And so the tradition is not the same. And when you don't have a real local production in a country, then you cannot have a strong interest in comics. Uh, I, I think the creators of today were the readers in their childhood and with a connection with their country and their preoccupations. This is, this is a problem. Uh, we, we see the example of Marjan Satrapi. She's very famous all over the world, but not in Iran. And she couldn't have created, of course, in, in, in Iran. So, so it's, it's strange. We, we read it from the exile. We, we read it from another point of view. And this is a case of many artists in the world. There's a great documentary called The Story of Film uh, by Mark Cousins. I'm sure lots of you have seen it. And it's an entirely personal view and history of cinema which is very, very different from the traditional one that you read of in books. Um, it, and I love that. I love the fact that he values other things rather than just commercial success and fame. Um, he values personal expression and far more than, uh, than those things. So um, I had a crack at writing my own one in this book that I've just finished, just for a couple of pages. But somebody really should do that, a proper alternate much more personalized view of, of what the history of comics could be because they're being created everywhere around the world. And I love to value local, local personal work uh, rather than working for an American corporate machine. I find that completely soul destroying. Mm -hmm. So um, there's definitely value in the personal. I think you'd need a series of Brits perspective on the history of comics, Spaniards perspective. And so yeah, I mean, it really bugs me. You know, I think one of the greatest comics ever made is Raymond Briggs' When the Wind, Wind Blows. It's regularly left out of histories of comics, as is Raymond Briggs as a creator. I think it's as important as Mouse, uh, but because it's not American and, and in all the bookshops. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's called When the Wind Blows. It's by Raymond Briggs. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd highly recommend it. Here, here. It was discussed in Parliament. Um, thank you both. Uh, before I hand over to Oliver East in some kind of relay race to talk about next year's uh, event, I'd just like to thank everyone involved today. Um, Dave and Benoit, all of the other fantastic speakers, uh, Le Caf, uh, and the University of Manchester for putting on 
uh, this year's event. And I hope all of you in the audience have enjoyed uh, the rich discussion and presentations that we've had today. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. to catch and we're all knackered after what has been a really inspiring um, life affirming day f for me just be being in a space w with everybody who loves um, comics as much as I do so th thanks for everybody for your presentations today um, save the same date next year 21st of Feb 2024 um, in the middle of a pand in the middle of the pandemic, almost two years ago, I was lucky enough to find that rare nugget in academia, a full time position um, in illustration at Sheffield Hallam. And the first thing I did after I told my mum was tell Julie from Lycaf because Julie from Lycaf and her group of, I want to say minions, but that might be <laughs> group of like half minions make cool shit happen. And I had an in at an institution, I had the illustration course in the palm of my hand. I was like, Julie, what can we do now? I've got this course. I've been described as a key member of the team so I can influence stuff. So I went to Julie, what can we do? Julie had already facilitated four, five of my weird walking shenanigans, so I knew she could make stuff happen. Um, so w a year and a half on, we've already been lucky um, recipients on the, on, on the BA on illustration to have visiting artists, comic artists, comic writers deliver workshops, and this convention, conference, sorry, convention, Comics convention, I just went there out of habit. This conference was part of the, co of the conversation as well. So, 21st of February, 24, um, I'll be stood up here again, probably wearing the same shirt. Um, we will be welcoming you to our grade two listed, I want to say Edwardian, but the Wi-Fi here is a bit patchy. I should know it, but it's either Victorian or Edwardian. Um, former post office in Sheffield. So we will be hosting the event in a, our School of Art and Design, um, which again, following on from um, Dave's uh, comments that comics should be pushed into every little space in, in the academy. Uh, we will be hosting the space in our lively graphic design studio, which is next door to our illustration studio, which is underneath our fashion studio, which is over the road from architecture and five minutes down the road from um, Hattie's department as well. So um, I gratefully receive the baton on behalf of Sheffield Hallam University, and hopefully we can see all your... Uh, faces there again next year. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>